Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Winfrey, and what you're about to listen to is a re-airing of an old episode of a podcast I used to host called Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. This episode originally aired March 14th, 2014, and focuses on the rogues gallery of everyone's favorite favorite webhead, Spider-Man. My guests for this particular episode are Benjamin J. Cologne, Robert Cooper, and Jason Teasley. This is not the best episode of the series that was ever produced, but it is far from the worst, and the worst ones, they may just never again see the light of day. We'll just let them die. Uh, Just for a little bit of context, if you're curious about why certain topics or characters or whatnot might be omitted from this discussion, March 14th, 2014 was a month and a half or so before the release of The Amazing Spider-Man Part 2, so there's no discussion of any of the... Re- uh, realities of that film. The Marvel Cinematic Universe was barely out of Phase 1. We're not that far removed from the first Avengers movie. So, if you're wondering about you know, some of the uh, specific, more recent versions of these characters, or anything in the comic books that happened after this particular date, why that's not discussed, it hadn't happened yet. We, this originally aired in 14, as, as previously mentioned. So, Thank you very much for listening to that. Let's, uh, before we get into it in proper, let's pay a couple of bills real fast. We do have a few sponsors for this particular podcast. Up first is Grammarly. For you listeners of the W2M network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. LinkedIn in particular would be kind of important. And if you're a public official, Twitter is... The lack of an edit button on Twitter is a problem. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash W2M network to download Grammarly for free. If you don't want to type all that in, there will be a link in the description below wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast. Our second sponsor is Amazon Music. Spider-Man has been home to some pretty iconic songs, uh, be that the theme song that everyone knows how to hum along to, uh, the Sam Raimi series of movies has some darn good music to it, Uh, The Amazing Spider-Man has, it's one of the saving graces of those movies, I think. So, if you want to get any of those, as well as more than 70 million other songs, Amazon Music can be had by you for 30 days free of charge on us. Go to getamazonmusic.com slash W2M network. There will be a link in the description below as well. Fill out the little form that lets everyone know that we're the ones that sent you, and you get 30 days free of charge to enjoy the, one of the best, if not the best, music streaming services that in the world right now. Once again, getamazonmusic.com slash W2M network, or just follow the link in the description either way. And with all of that out of the way... Let me throw it back to myself, Jason Teasley, Robert Cooper, and Benjamin J. Cologne in the year 2014 to discuss the villains of Spider-Man. Past me, take it away. Ladies and 
gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for joining us here on Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. However you got here, download, blog talk, iTunes, Stitcher, various nefarious means. I don't care, you're listening, and I thank you for it. I don't have a show without you. Well, I would, because I don't especially care. I do this because I enjoy it, and evidenced by the fact that I don't get paid for it, by and large. But thank you for joining us here. I appreciate it, whether you're an old fan, a new fan, giving us just a second or third outing. Thanks for being here with us. I do appreciate you guys. This is Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. I am your host, the authority on evil, Mr. Robert Winfrey. And I'd like to also wish everyone a happy pie day, because it is 3.14. And I'll take any excuse to eat pie. It's a delicious, particular bit of delicacy. And just any excuse. I'm down for any excuse. But we're not talking about pie tonight. We're talking about bad guys. We're talking about... One of the most popular, one of the most uh, iconic uh, comic book characters, and we're tackling his his rogues gallery, and he's got a good one. You see, when I decided I was going to start taking on comic book characters, I knew some people would get interested. I had people who wanted to be in on the Joker. I had people who wanted in on X-Men. I had a lot of guys, a lot of ideas, and a lot of different ones that I thought, okay, I'll have people interested in being on for this show. When I said Spider-Man, He's like, everybody I knew went, me, me, pick me. So they're kind of all here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Spider-Man, one of the most popular, and if you listen to Stan Lee when he's lucid, he calls him the greatest comic book hero ever. Eh, debatable, I'll give you the most relatable, but that's about as far as I personally go, f- go with that one. But like I said, I've got guests, and... First up, I, I got both guys from the cheap seats here, folks, so they're invading. <laughs> they, have left, they have left the cheap seats, and they are now here. But first up, uh, Robert Cooper is back. He was here when we talked about the uh, the villains of X-Men, and he's back again. More punishment. How you doing, Coop? Uh, I'm doing wonderful. Now this podcast will have to see, considering how the cheap seats went last night, where it went from a 15-minute rant and then devolved into bad puns. And the Stinky Pete. Well, I will mute anyone who mentions Stinky Pete. So we'll just go with that. <laughs> Damn it. That, that, that's where that's Unless we're referencing the hygiene of Peter Parker, we're going to have to leave that. We have to leave Stinky Pete at the door here. Uh, and my other guest at this time, one of the founders of the, the other member of the Cheap Seats, Jason Teasley is here. How you doing, Jason? Hey, what's up, man? I was actually going to have St- Stinky Pete sub in for me for tonight while I played God of War. <laughs> no, I will not allow that. Stinky Pete is not. Okay, uh... I got it. Stinky Pete. You can you must play God of War while I'm on the podcast. <laughs> okay, you can replay it so, anyway. It's God of War it has infinite replay value. As soon as anytime you feel upset, that's the most cathartic experience. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm liking it pretty well. But I appreciate you having me on, Robert. Hey, I'm. Yeah, I'm happy to have you know guests, call-ins, and you said again when I mentioned Spider-Man, you and you know, Cooper said I want in, and you said I must be here to talk about Carnage. Yes. So the ultimate evil. Eh, if you uh, want to go, well, I don't know about I'll, that. I'll give, you, I'll give you the ultimate one dimension. Yeah, see that's that, that, the that, we'll, we'll have evil. a fun debate with that because I, I'm, I'm I'm there with Robert. <laughs> We'll get to the symbiotes. That, that's on the list. And all right, so let's jump in. Let's hit the big one. Right off the bat, another one that debatably is one of the worst villains ever, and Spider-Man's kind of arch nemesis, the man with the glider and the green skin and the psychosis. Now, I'm going to say Norman Osborn here instead of Green Goblin, because Green Goblin has been many people. There's been a bunch of different guys that have taken over the mantle, but... For my money, Green Goblin was never better than when Norman Osborn had, was suffering one of his psychotic breaks. So, Coop, I want to start with you. You know, how, where do you, as far as the Green Goblin and Norman Osborn specifically, where do you rate him as far as just all time? I mean, he's one of the best Spider-Man villains ever, if not the. He's like the quintessential Spider-Man nemesis. But do you rate him all that highly when compared with other guys in the I, comic book? I think world? I do. I do. I never really think about villain rankings. It's just one that like I can rank metal albums all day, but when you, when you get the superheroes, I'm like, that's kind of that's kind of you know a little a little bumpy. Like I th- the Joker is still my favorite, and you know unfortunately I would put Green Goblin over Doctor Doom. Sorry, Pat, I'm not a big Fantastic Four guy. But uh, Green Goblin, I think he is just awesome. He he was one of the first villains I've ever seen that used the uh, used the logic of why don't I follow him and see if where he goes. 
And that's how he found out who Spider-Man was. <laughs> he Basically. just followed him home one day. That's a good one. Yeah, that's what he. That's what he did. That he. That's it. He's the first person to find out who Peter was because he just. He's like, huh? I wonder what happened if I just followed him around. So he like hit him with some bomb that uh, muted his spider sense and just followed him the whole time. And that's how he found out. That was that is brilliant. You know, I read a ton of 60s Spider-Man in eighth grade because I had a teacher who was a total bitch, but she had an awesome comic book collection for everybody to read. So. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've all got some kind of memories like that. All right. uh, now, Jason, I want to go to you for this one. Uh, well, first of all, are you, you know, have you read a lot of the comics, or are you, you know, what, what was your introduction kind of to the character? Because my introduction, and for my money, like the best Spider-Man kind of medium, for me at least, is the 90s Saturday morning cartoon, which is where I got introduced to the character. Yeah, well, we have something in common, <laughs> because that is how <laughs> I got introduced to the character through the 90s. <laughs> cartoon you had that and the x-men and uh yeah that's how i got introduced to spider-man um check started watching it like all oh, kids saturday morning cartoons gotta love them they went away sadly but yeah i mean that was my first introduction to spider-man was the 90s cartoon got i got hooked on it so it was like well you know my mom worked at a local uh grocery store that had a comic book section so i started regularly picking up spider-man so I started reading it and catching up, and then, you know, you know how you do when you're kids. Uh, you kind of trade comics and stuff and get get story arcs here and there. So, yeah, I mean, it was that was my introduction. So what was the first major Spider-Man arc that you read? Do you remember, or the first, the first yes. one that sticks in your mind? Yes, and we will be talking about it later, which was Maximum Carnage. Okay. <laughs> And I, you know, I get some I get some grief because the first one I actually wound up reading, and I'm not a big reader of comic books. Um, you know, I do my research for these, and I've, I'm aware of what's going on. I just don't act – I very rarely have the time and finances or the inclination and whatnot to physically buy the books and read. But the first one that I read, I kind of picked up on a whim at a grocery store, and I kind of got dropped into the middle of the 90s redux of the Clone Saga. Which, which universally makes everyone groan. <laughs> Such a headache. But yeah. and so again, the first time I so the first Spider Man that I actually read and saw in print was not Spider Man, it was the Scarlet Spider Man and I thought his costume was better anyway. I love Scarlet but, Spider Man. Yeah. But Okay, but that's and I mean the fact that they wound up using to, I mean, as badly received as the clone saga was, when they revealed at the end that haha it was all you know, kind of masterminded by Norman Oz. I mean, was that... Yeah, I'm bringing it back. I mean, was that genius, or was that just, we need something to kind of save this? Because everyone hated the Clone Saga. So if we if we kind of cap it off by bringing back the Green Goblin, and revealing that he committed statutory rape, I think, with Gwen Stacy, and got her yeah. pregnant, had kids... I mean, initially he's just kind of a crazy, moral, somewhat morally bankrupt, entrepreneurial guy... And then just the more he shows up, the more of a bastard he turns into. Yeah, I think it just sounded like it was them throwing him a bone. Like, you know, uh, I mean, we've all played games, watched, you know, stuff where it was a total fucking disaster. So at the end, they just tried to salvage it by giving them everybody something they can't boo. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's that's kind of how I look at it. Though, uh, interesting enough, the first Spidey comic I read was uh, this Identity Crisis. It's when he couldn't be Spider-Man or something, so he uh, suited up in four different costumes at the same time. Like he, I think one was like the Prodigy, and one was Dusk, and another one was Ricochet, and the fourth one was something but a rocket. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I got those as a kid, because my dad bought them for me. It was awesome. But yeah, I guess I've actually forgotten that Norman Osborn was the one that was at the whole uh, the whole end of the second Clone Wars. Because, well, yeah, I think most first, people... You, you had the original yeah. Clone Saga that was just kind of there. I mean, it wasn't a bad thing. You had, like, a... Everybody was doing clones about then. Yeah. I was actually going to bring up that guy, too. Because he, cause he, he'll lead me into something else. The Jackal? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, Jack yeah. Was, he was the you know, and during the Clone Saga, he was the one that everyone kind of pointed at. He was the one manipulating various Spider Man and Kane, who was the first clone that was suffering from cellular degeneration. And he had a little buddy 
not a real uh, a little like mini jackal I recall who had the, who was a clone and they make a big deal out of the fact that their genetic material was just inferior so they were just slowly degenerating at a cellular level. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. He's the one that led the uh, 70s clone saga. And he brought in the Punisher. That's where I was actually going to get it. Yeah. It's, I'll go, I'll go into that Punisher. because that was kind of my I first did. exposure to Punisher. I didn't know he brought in Punisher. <laughs> yeah, that's Punisher. the first first appearance of the Punisher. Uh, he Jackal had convinced Punisher that Spider-Man was a menace. So, uh, you know. No doubt um, helped by Jonah to... Jameson, who we will oh, get I to know. as well. When I talk, talk about Spider-Man and somebody convincing me that, I have to do J. Jonah Jameson impersonation. But, yeah, he had convinced uh, the Punisher that uh, Spider-Man was a bad guy. So the Punisher tried to kill him, and at the end of it, uh, Spidey convinced him that, you know, Punisher was being manipulated. And don't think he succeeded in killing the Jackal, but, yeah, that's the first time the Punisher showed up. Ta-da. <laughs> Ta-da. Right, yeah, they, well, mm-hmm. that also led to the – I don't know if you – have you guys seen the Twitter exchange between the Punisher and Spider-Man? <laughs> no, I have no. not. That sounds awesome, though. Oh, it's – I'm going to try and remember it off the top of my head. Anybody out there who, like, has a link or something, feel free to hit me with it. But it starts you off know with, who's, You know who's going to post, right? You know our super fan. You'll post that. Probably, yeah. Uh, if I can get my properly. There we go. Oh, oh, well, let's see. Here's the first appearance of the Punisher. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but here's the – but it starts off with Peter – with Spider-Man putting on Twitter, whoever does the Spider-Man account on Twitter – Man, Doc Ock escaped from prison again. I don't know what I should do. What, what should I do about this? And the Punisher's response is shoot him in the head. So, <laughs> no, I, I can't do that. What, what do you mean? I, I can't shoot him in the head. That's not what I... No, no, kill him. That's the only way you're going to solve this problem. I don't kill people. You're morally bankrupt. Yeah, well, my bad guys don't keep coming back either. I just, it, <laughs> you know, for his, but that was just... Yeah, the, and they still have some, you know, ever after... You know, they work together on occasion, but those two still don't like each other. But yeah, Punisher's one who opposed Spider-Man in the beginning, and yes, courtesy of the Jackal, whose real name, I'm going to find out here because it's going to bug me, uh, Dr. Miles, who's a geneticist, mind you, <laughs> who became obsessed with trying to clone Spider-Man, and just, his whole work led to so many problems, just for everyone in general, but okay, we've mentioned him before, I want I wanted to get to this guy, because as much as he's an antagonist for Spider-Man, there's something about J. Jonah Jameson that is just almost impossible to really dislike. I mean, am I wrong there? Is or is it just you know he hate he dislikes Spider Man and every you kind of roll your eyes because he hates the guy so much, but you never really boo Jameson. I mean, at least I never did. I mean, Coop, am I off? Am I the only one here who feels that way? Uh, he's kind of an asshole, but a lovable asshole. He's like that one like asshole uncle that shows up at all your like family get-togethers but you still run up and give him a hug because at the end of the day while he's a bit of a grizzly douche he's still kind of a nice guy and he's kind of a little bit of a odd mustache charisma that's how i kind of see it like he's a very charismatic character like he's one of those uh, like he's like ted dibiase there we go oh yeah, he's, he's like Ted DiBiase. like he's been a bad guy for so long but you know at the end of the day you kind of love him, and you just can't hate him after a while. Well, I'd I was say more of the J. Bobby Hill. I was or, thinking or J. J. Bobby Hill. Right. Uh, before we get too much further into this, uh, I'd like to bring on now a uh, special guest, the guy who – actually, if you're listening or you've seen the pictures, uh, we have a nice title card for this. It was donated and to us by – the artist who's joining us now live, uh, Benjamin J. Cologne, is here with us. How you doing, Ben? Good evening. Yeah. Still there? No, no, no. Yep, we're all here. <laughs> okay, cool. The gang's all here. Yeah. Tried calling in on Skype, and it didn't work, so I'm on my phone. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, we got you good. I'll let you know if you have connection issues or anything. Sure. All right, well, you. I know you were planning on calling in earlier, and Skype and Blog Talk have a very acrimonious relationship as mm-hmm. an evidence spot. There's a long list of evidence for that. But uh, anything about Norman Osborn or the Green Goblin in general that you wanted to bring up before we move on? Because that's you know, kind of the big one that – well, one of the two big ones that everyone likes to talk about. Yeah, actually, um, it's funny because the Green Goblin is my favorite Spider-Man villain, but very specifically Harry Osborn, which is Norman's son. Oh, you like um, Little Goblin. Goblin Jr. Yeah, because you, you talk a little bit about like when you got into Spider-Man comics. Well, I got into Spider-Man comics right around the 
the very early 90s, and that was when uh, there was this long two, almost three-year story arc that dealt with uh, Harry Osborn becoming the Green Goblin and losing his mind and uh, uh, trying to make uh, Peter Parker's life miserable. And it, it was uh, it, it ended up being his redemption story, but it was so well done. It was like it really set the bar really high for what I consider to be like a really quality, uh, you know, superhero comic story. So just... Very briefly, did that then make you dislike Spider-Man Three all the more, all the that much more? Because you had James Franco and everyone doing an abbreviated version of that, and none of them doing it very well. I would like nothing more than for you know for James Franco to die the same death that Gwen Stacy did. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, damn! Wow. wow. No, well, uh, yeah. you... if you want to go, if you want to go ultimate Gwen Stacy, she just got eaten by Carnage and turned into like your husk and bone, so we can go with that one. It's mm-hmm. all good. It's As long as James Franco is in pain, I'm fine with it. <laughs> I don't even acknowledge Spider-Man 3. The The third Spider-Man to me is the reboot. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a second to talk real quick about what what, what really pissed me off about Spider-Man 3? Is... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to assume it's Topher Grace's Venom, but go ahead. Not even. It, it's. Uh, I always say, like, you know, there, there's actually a pretty good movie somewhere in Spider-Man 3, and the fact when that you it's, you know, the happy- studio meddling, I mean, I, you know, yeah. I, no, go ahead. I, don't mean, I don't mean to cut you off, go ahead, make your point, sorry. Uh, just real quick, just, you know, the, the only thing worse than a terrible movie is a movie that's half good and half terrible, because you can kind of see where it could have been great, and it just failed so hard, like, I hate that more, so that's what Spider-Man 3 is to me, especially as a Spider-Man fan, that hurt that it came close to being good and it just plummeted off a tall, tall building or bridge, if you will. But there was no saving it for Snap Snack to put it out of its misery. Here's the question, though. Was it the Brooklyn Bridge or the George Washington Bridge? Okay, I I can can speak on this um, because I have – okay, I'll try to make this quick. Um, It's the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm I'm from New York, by the way, so I know this for a fact. It – it's drawn as the Brooklyn Bridge in the comic. It's referred to in the comic as the George Washington Bridge. I don't know how that got screwed up, seeing as how Marvel is based in New York City, and they could probably see the bridge from their offices, but uh, it was it, it was written incorrectly. Visually, it's definitely the Brooklyn Bridge, and I think reprints of the original comic corrected that, but trust me, it's, it's the Brooklyn Bridge. It was drawn as the Brooklyn Bridge, and that's what I always call it. Uh, I okay, would say so, royalties, royalties is what caused it. <laughs> uh, so speaking of, since I feel like we didn't talk about Green Goblin much at all, I feel kind of ashamed well, of that. Well, hey, what do you got to what you gotta say about it, Coop? Well, like, I'm happy to yeah, well, speaking, of, speaking of Gwen Stacy, well, as we all, well, I think we all know, he's the one that killed her. Yeah, hey, no, spoiler I alert. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> that that comic is older than like most me? of oh okay it's older than probably me and Teasley combined. No, I came so okay. close to buying that comic one that one time not too long ago. Oh. And let's be fair, it's uh. called the night Gwen Stacy died. <laughs> there's no ambiguity here. And, and, and there's the whole thing thing of <laughs> there's the whole psychological aspect of Peter not knowing if she was dead already or the web killed her. Uh, I say Peter Parker killed her because it's much more fun that way. Peter Parker killed her because that's what physics says. He did. Well, 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 I'm sorry, but he did. Arresting arresting a sharp fall causes severe trauma. Now, I don't. I I've got a picture. I've got the link. uh, Jesse Starcher posted a link to him arresting her fall. She's still most of the way to the ground, and that's a tall bridge. Stopping. A fall when you have that much energy built up is going to stopping it sharply causes all kinds of trauma. Now, whether Spider-Man stops you with a web or Superman catches you flying the other direction or you hit the pavement, it hurts and it will so kill you if you fall far enough. Shouldn't he know that since he is like a I, that's what kills me about his scientific genius. He has no basic physics here. <laughs> I mean, she has a well, I mean, he is a 
genius play, panicking, but maybe he was just a like better shit. chance of surviving maybe. hitting the water than she does if he well, stops her if she's gone that far. Well, he didn't think well, about he, that. Like, grab her like foot because yeah, it was like. Yeah, I mean, he did, yeah. Or, I mean, the, why didn't he just dive down after, her, sacrifice himself? The world would have been a better place. Or, or, or maybe just then, me. like, that's just another like, shot a web and went under <laughs> her. And oh. again, at, at that point, you're still arresting the fall very quickly, which causes the forces to collapse. And it's a huge issue that like every every superhero story ever written doesn't address how do you stop someone who's fallen 30 stories? I figured stories? it out. Superman. I figured it out. No, I figured it out. If Zach, right, Morris, can call, if Zach Morris can call time out, he, why can't Spider-Man? <laughs> Spider-Man can call time out, went, pushed her like out in the deep end of the water, hey, it would have been all good. Or he could have just got her and carried her to the ground already. Zach Morris could have been Spider-Man's ally. If it was Deadpool, he'd have pulled out a remote and rewound the scene. But come on. Either that or he just commentated the whole time. He's like, oh, well, there she goes. Oh, well, maybe it's time to stop her. Snap. Oh, well, that was an unfortunate death. Oh, well. Maybe I'll get him next time. <laughs> oh, Deadpool. All right, well, I wanted to – okay, Benjamin, since you brought up Harry Osborn as kind of – as his turn as the Green Goblin – how does he suit, uh, suit you as a villain? You know, because in addition to being the Green Goblin, Harry has donned other personas and at various times to be a nemesis of Spider-Man. So has he only worked for you as the new Goblin, or has there been another kind of arc or persona that kind of resonated with you? Um, I I like mainly, I like the dynamic they played in the comics against, uh, you know, between... Peter Parker and Harry Osborn just because, um, you know, it's my best friend who has become a supervillain, but not just any supervillain because he's the son of, you know, the man who killed, you know, my first love. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to, there's a lot in that that's, uh, you know, a lot of conflict and, um, it's it, it it makes for great drama and it did. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what you're referring to with the different personas, unless you're talking about like recently, like American Son, that kind of thing, where they put him in basically the Iron Patriot armor. Um, I yeah, might I thought he was be only Harry. I might be yeah. misremembering. So my apologies. Hmm. Yeah, yeah he was the I second Green Goblin, and then he died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. My apologies. I misremember. That's my favorite single issue of like any comic ever of all time was Harry was the the issue that where Harry Osborne died, by the way. That was like as, as good as it gets for me. I mean, yeah, a uh, well but, done death is a beautiful thing. I mean it's odd yeah. to say that, but it's absolutely because he redeems himself in the end. He ends up saving uh his son's life. He has a son in, in the comics. He ends up saving his son's life, he ends up saving saving uh Mary Jane Watson and then ultimately after almost him to die, he saves Spider Man. And then he dies, and his life. Well, he was, his, he, was, he would have just screwed up after that and been evil again, right? I mean, <laughs> that's kind, that's kind of the impetus behind all of the heroic sacrifices to turn you good. Is well, I've done good, man. If I if I survive this, there's a good chance I'll go back to being evil again. Well, um, it's uh, it's kind of better off that he died the way he did. But here's the thing about that: in the comics, he's alive again, and um. Well, Thanks a lot. Really one died. more day. Well, that's a direct result of that's one of the, that's that's the other thing that one more day you know screwed up. Um, In addition to everything. The way, yeah. If we want to talk about Spider-Man villains, you can throw Joe Quesada in there too. Um, <laughs> you can, oh, yeah. If if you really want to. Um, huh. Spider-Man has but, to be single. How can we fix this? Yeah, magic. <laughs> well, let's throw in the devil. You know, yeah. it wouldn't be like Mary Jane's finally had it up to here with his superhero shenanigans. Fucking devil. Yeah. <laughs> fuck you, Casada. You fuck. That's where that's where that title card came from, by the way. That's the title card that Rage built. I haven't seen the title card. I haven't seen oh, the yeah, title card. Oh yeah, if you click, a, if, I don't know if you have a computer. Uh, readily available, oh. but if you look at the streaming, oh. if you look at the page that we're streaming on, our title card is. Uh, Benjamin's rendering of Spider-Man punching Mephisto in the face. <laughs> I've got about half yeah. of it on my... But it looks pretty awesome. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm about good. Mephisto, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah oh, I, I'll post a link to the uh, DeviantArt version. 
in the final show. Sure. So you Thanks. can find that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that does uh, <laughs> All right, uh, we've got another call, so I'm going to bring that on real fast here. Area code 732, you're live, and we're talking Spider-Man villains. What do you got to say? Hello, everybody. How you doing? So, as long as we're going to throw Joe Cazada in the mix, and rightfully so, shouldn't we also be throwing J. Michael Straczynski in that mix for introducing the ridiculous spider totem idea and the crappy, crappy, crappy villain Moreland? <laughs> yeah. The hell out of that. I actually like J. Michael Straczynski's run, though. Like it did I, lo- some I, I loved it. You guys really like the idea of the spider totem and him turning into part spider, mystic spider that bites the, the throat out of Moreland. I'll defend well, that. I never, oh, well, I never said I was going to defend that. But beyond that, it was fairly good until we got to one more day, which I was like, well, you know, I don't want any more days of this comic go away. He fought that. Yeah, Sam I, I, kind of fought that. I, I, see, here's my thing with Straczynski. I think when he's doing characters steeped in some sort of mythology, like a Thor, a Wonder Woman, a Superman, he's very good. But when he has to take the character that's supposed to relate to the everyman, like a Spider-Man, I think he's absolutely dreadful and doesn't understand what exactly he needs to do to keep this character relevant to the audience. And then he throws in all these odd twists and turns, and we get the resulting stuff like one more day out of it, for example. One more right. day. Uh, yep. No, go ahead. Sorry, I don't know if I stepped on your toes. Well, there. one more day was editorially mandated. Like the, J. Michael Straczynski was not happy with the fact that he his last act as writing writer of Spider Man was basically to undo the previous seven years that he spent writing it. Um, <laughs> that's the first thing. Too. Spider <laughs> thing, by the way. The Spider Man told him thing, by the way, really quick. Um, that was never. Confirmed. That was never said for sure whether or not it was true. It was always left implied, or it was always left up to you know that it wasn't completely certain, and it kind of reinforces that. And for, at the end of the first Moreland story, it basically says he basically says I don't care whether or not you know where my powers came from. It doesn't really matter. So that's kind of how I look at it. You know, it, it it basically is make up your own canon at the end of that story. So that you know I don't. I just accept it. So you imagine he's what? Par- he's either partially mutated or he goes full zombie and ripping the guy's throat out. That was, I think, that was much later. That was that was a different story called the other, where which was also written by committee and you know was not oh. that great. You can't write by committee. It's a bad idea. Yeah, and you can't write it for just idea. well. Enough. <laughs> I'd get that in there. Uh, that right. man should um, know how to rule the ultimate universe. <laughs> hey. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Jason kind of informed me that he's that there's a bit of a clock here. So in deference to him and the fact that he wants to talk about carnage, here's your here's oh, your no, chance. No, go on. Uh, no, 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 that's okay. I mean, we got to get to the symbiotes eventually, and we're, since we're kind of <laughs> skipping Venom because Mark yeah, Radliff yeah. wants to be in on that one. Yeah, the carnage. Man I mean, said being a soft limits tonight. Now, carnage is. I mean, there's a bunch of other symbiotes. I mean, I don't even want to go through all the names because they're some of them are yeah. just kind of amusing. But carnage is kind of the only other one that gets mentioned a lot, or or you know has some kind of merit to him. So <laughs> uh, here's your platform, yeah, and then you can leave, and then you know we'll keep going with the flow and whatnot. But I just wanted to make sure you get your chance to kind of ex- espouse why you like carnage so much. <laughs> The reason why I like Courtney so much is because, I mean, what's there not to be like, like about him? I mean, he is a ginger, so I can relate there. It means he has no soul, just like me. I mean, being the ginger kid, and you, you see this in the comic books, you kind of you kind of migrate toward it. So, And then he's just batshit crazy. I mean, he's a psychopath serial killer that is just so lovable <laughs> when the Sibionite bonds to him after the escape of Eddie Brock that it's just and it's so heartbreaking when he does the run of Maximum Carnage which is absolutely one of the best crossovers that I've read I mean that's debatable because I mean you have so many people he is just such an indestructible force with everybody that he bands together in just this madness killing spree across New York that it's just kind of not, can't not like him, especially when he's in the church and he's just by himself and just, like, has that isolation moment. It's just, you can understand why he's so fucked up in the head. Well, kinda, the backstory of the gotta, character, gotta like well, the backstory of the character, even prior to being bonded with the Carnage symbiote, you know, there's all of the, you know, kind of 
psychopathic triangle of all you know he's got all of the markers and all the precursors and all the things that you need to watch for i mean he kills his mother to, by pushing her down the stairs he tortures and kills a dog i mean just all kinds of horrible stuff that he does before he becomes super powerful i actually this <laughs> Cletus's father is the one who killed his mother. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. I am misinformed. My apologies. Yes. yes. Um, I was... What is the coup? Hmm? Yeah, like like the mother... Grandmother. Tried... Sorry, yeah. grandmother. He killed his grandmother. Yeah. Which makes it worse. Yeah, because Cletus's mother tried to kill Cletus. And so his dad <laughs> ends up killing his mom. And, I mean, it's just such a so clusterfuck family. Some people have no chance. I mean... Uh, Benjamin, you're you're an artist, so I'm kind of curious as to how you feel about the visual design of Carnage, because for my money, he's like the coolest looking of all the symbiotes. Um, yeah, I, li- I actually really like Carnage. I like the look of him. Um, I remember getting that first comic, and they they teased it on the back of like a few issues pre- pre- previous, and you know, typical Marvel style. They they, they you know they do the hype in full effect, and it's like. You know, they say on the back of the cover, you know, if if, if uh, you think this, you know, this is a major new Spidey villain, and if you think it reminds you of Venom, you ain't seen nothing yet. So, like, that was uh, the first the first image of Carnage we see is the cover to the issue that he first appears in, and he basically, like, looks like he's ready to skewer Spider-Man, like, right on the cover. So that just grabs you right away. Um, and he's got... You know, his powers are really freaky. He can control the symbiote. He can practically shape shift. And, um, you know, being a psychotic serial killer, of course, goes off T-1000 and, you know, creates all of these stabbing weapons and knives and axes and maces and weapons of, uh, you know, torture and bloodletting. Oh, yeah. And, and like I said, I mean, it's just how they built him up is – because, I mean – Everybody that they paired him with, it's just a... And he, he refers to him as his quote-unquote family because they're just as evil and f***ed up in the head as he is. There's no redeeming qualities about Cletus Cassidy or Carney. No, I completely agree. He's... I mean, you know, I give you a little bit of grief when I say he's one-dimensional because I... And some of that is... is... Can I throw something in here with that real quick? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, here's a th- um, I know... Uh, Mark wanted to talk about Venom separately. Um, I won't get into Venom too much, but I actually like Carnage a lot more than I like Venom. I've or never liked. Man. I have never liked Venom as much as most people do, um, because I, you know, I never liked his backstory. Um, I always look at it like I, I actually like Carnage just because he's a lot simpler and he makes no bones about the fact that he's nuts. He's a killer. He loves being a killer, and that's who he is. Um, I always thought Venom had the most half-assed excuse for being what he was, and I, that, I never liked that about him. <laughs> Somebody's mom's calling. Well, it's not mine. She's asleep. You'd know yeah. if she were up. She'd come in and tell me she got the fuck up and go to sleep. Yeah. That was my phone. Sorry, guys. I'm on Skype, it's so okay. my phone rings from time to time. It's okay. Live radio. You're, you're the... You're the... You're the host. You can screw up. Trust me. I do it every <laughs> every Thursday night. I do it. Yes, he does. All right. Uh, we got another caller here. He's been on hold for a while, so I want to get to you. Area code 818. You're live, and we're talking Spider-Man villains. What do you got for us? Hello, Robert. This is 411 Mania's Jeffrey Harris. How's everyone doing tonight? Pretty good. Dandy. How are you doing, Jeff? Is someone okay? It sounded like someone was losing their breath or having a heart attack. I'm good. I'm good. All of those are possible. It might have been me. Is everyone okay? Yeah, yeah I, I think was so. Me. Okay, yeah, uh, Robert, uh, Robert I love on this uh, run of uh, Comic Rogues uh, shows you've been doing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, big fan of the Spider-Man Rogues. I think you just wanted to chime in. My favorite Spider-Man Rogue, and I think one of the most underrated Rogues of all time, is Craven the Hunter. You know, one of the classic, uh, I would say, uh, original Spider-Man. You know, he was created uh, in, in uh, the 1960s, so he's been around... Uh, for a long time. He was created by Stan Lee and uh, Steve Nicko. So this is like one of the original Spider-Man books. And one of my favorite stories uh, ever was uh, The Last Hunt in the 1980s because this was a story where, for all intents and purposes, Craven beats Spider-Man. This is before Dr. O- you know, Dr. Octopus had to basically let Peter Parker mind swap with him in order to beat him. But Craven did it himself in the 1980s. 
and um, he beat Spider-Man. He buried him alive, and he assumed uh, Spider-Man's uh, identity, the Spider-Man identity, not Peter Parker. Um, and and he was like, well, I've 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 hunted the most dangerous game. That's it. And he killed himself. Spider-Man lived. He he lived to fight another day, but he was beaten by this guy. And I and I thought, how amazing is that? And uh, uh, I. I don't know if we could ever see him in like a Spider-Man movie, but since they're doing Sinister Six, I think that might be a good way to introduce him. But I think you you might I don't know, I don't know how you I think you would have to change him. But he's just a he's just a really competent hunter, and to him, Spider-Man is the most dangerous game. And this was a character that predated things like you know uh, the the Predator movie. It's kind of almost like. Um, what was that, that that old classic 1930s movie, The Most Dangerous Game, where man is the most dangerous game? Well, in the Marvel Universe, it's it's the superhero. So I really think that's a, that's an interesting angle. And uh, so I was wondering what you guys thought of that. Well, uh, I, 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 I see. Hold on, I got a question. Um, how about how Doctor Octopus beat Spider Man in like Spider Man number three? That was like 20 years before Craven did it, wasn't it? I'm not counting that. Well, that's that. Why not? Stinky uh, Pete said it was okay. Stinky Pete. Hey, so hey. Don't, don't go off. I have power here. I will drop you guys. <laughs> I didn't do it. Look, I love I love Doctor Octopus too. So I mean, you know, I I just wanted to I just wanted to express my man love for Craven the Hunt. Hi, right, Jeff. Craven. Thanks for calling in, Jeff. It is just that I was actually going to mention that story. It's it's probably my favorite uh, Spider-Man story because. When I think of Spider-Man, I think of him like definitely than I would Batman. Batman, I always think of like you know, I always think of like ten stories right off the top of my head. Spider-Man actually has some trouble doing that. I kind of think of just like moments, but I never really think of storylines. That's one of the ones that I actually go to, and I'm like, I can po- I point at that and like that's the best one right there because it really was showing a character like Craven who was a solid character. You know, he wasn't anything. Too, too evil. Yeah, but, I don't. I don't know, look at Craven as a as a main villain in Spider Man. I think of he's. I think he's like one of the B level villains. Honestly, I mean, yeah, he was a great hunter, but I mean, compared to the likes of Doc Ock and all these. Yeah, but, but, it, it was, but, but with that story, they took what it was a B level villain, more of a minor villain, and made him incredibly memorable, and just gave us a great story and a great character study on the character. Well, and then we got his son for. The Clone Saga. <laughs> that oh, also. Just kind of, oh, I'm going to keep bringing that up, but <laughs> I didn't even know that happened. <laughs> uh, ben, you've been quiet for a while. What's your take on Craven? And you know, uh, Coop kind of brought up Craven's Last Hunt, which one of the better sto- uh, Spider-Man story arcs. Okay. Um, just, I don't know how on. many. I don't know what. I don't know how many people know this, but this might. I don't know how how you feel about this, but would you guys believe that? Craven's Last Hunt actually originally, like in its infancy, began as a Batman Joker story. What really? Did you I did see it. It, it did. I did see it. That is the writer awesome. J.M. Demetrius is, is the writer. He also wrote the Death of Harry Osborn and that whole thing. He's one of my favorite Spider-Man writers, by the way. I, I love Craven's Last Hunt to death. Um, it's one of the few times because th- this was right in the middle of you know grim, dark, grim and gritty mid you know. 80s when, you know, Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen and uh, Swamp Thing and, and uh, a lot of the dark 80s stuff was really coming into its own. And this was before the 90s hit and all of that stuff became crap. This was, you know, when people were still telling dark stories that were good. Crazy the Last Hunt <laughs> was one of those. And it was one of the, it's probably one of the few Spider-Man stories that was as dark as it was, but still worked. Like I, I, there's not a whole lot of dark Spider-Man stories that, you know, that feel right because Spider-Man is generally a pretty lighthearted, adventurous, you know, type of character. Um, this was done well because it was it was really breaking down these characters and these parallels between you know Spider-Man's fear of death and Craven's fear of, like, failure. Um, really heady stuff that, you know, it was, it was executed really well. The artwork was awesome. The cover, the image of, you know, Spider-Man, you know, uh, uh, digging himself out of his own grave is, like, one of the coolest things ever. But, yeah, just, I, yeah, I love I, I love the story to death. Yeah, that's, it was a, just a great story. And I think the problem with the 
late 90s in general was a lot of it was dark for the Sega Dark. Exactly. You know, like, they didn't, like, they didn't try to at least give a reason. At least with a lot of the 80s stuff that was dark, you know, there was still some that was a little unnecessarily so. But for, for the most part, they gave a reason and really made it worthwhile when it came to, you know, making some dark stories. But I guess if we're going to talk about one Russian guy, I guess we should talk about the other Russian guy, right? Yeah. For the villain from the very first Spider-Man issue. Mm-hmm. Chameleon? In Chameleon. Spider-Man number one. Yeah. Some, weren't they brothers? I'm pretty sure they were brothers. I, I don't, don't remember. know. I will look up. I will do some research. See if I can find out. Yeah, because I was pretty sure they were brothers. But Chameleon's one. Chameleon was never, like, too special a character. Half they're brother. always half brother. They're half brother. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> they're related to someone. Yeah, I always, uh, always thought Chameleon was kind of cool. I think he, he was really given a lot more series than anything. There, there was always, like, a few cool plots with him and his damn photo belt that can make it to where he can turn into the people he takes a picture of. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, 90s so, technology. Oh, nice. Hey, so fun. I love the 90s. And the 80s. <laughs> oh, you. I love the 90s, too. You know, the good old days when I could play Pokemon and crap my pants. Well, hey, if you're going to bring up the other... Well, the other Russian that worthy of discussion is the Rhino. He's is he Russian? I thought he, he was. I didn't think he was Russian. No, no, I thought he was. He a is. Damn New Yorker. I believe he's Russian. Yeah. I'm gonna double check he's, myself he's a, here. But in, he's in Russian the in the new movie. Yeah. I was not thinking that he was Russian. I just thought he was a uh, uh, mid-level hitman. Oh there, well, yeah. There was some... Yes, he was. Was there was some retconning that occurred with that, like somewhere along the line. I'm not sure exactly where, but they, they uh, originally, it a yeah, of times. I got it right here. I got it here in front of you. Originally, he's a poor Russian immigrant who becomes a thug and uses a Anglo an anglicized name. But originally, yeah, he's a Russian immigrant. Oh, oh. I'm learning this so much stuff tonight. Yeah, see, I right. forgot. I'm, I, I'm a, I was I'm a thinking of the, I was thinking of the uh, cartoon one, like that. But my favorite Rhino story. Have you ever heard of Flowers for Rhino? I've heard of <laughs> it. I, need, I really need to read it. Yeah, I, I picked it up from my well, formerly local comic shop years ago. Uh, but it's a two-part story. It is, it's pretty much taking Flowers for Al- Algae God. <laughs> Except if, if you don't mind me spoiling, he gets bored. And instead of killing himself, he's like, fuck it, I'm just going to rip this shit out. <laughs> so he, he, he gets bored of being smart, so he just goes back to being dumb. <laughs> oh, Rhino. Uh, it was... <laughs> Such a great story. Yeah, Rhino is another one of those. Uh, like, I'm looking forward to seeing how he's going. I'm really worried about that in the upcoming movie. So many well, can I can I go go ahead and spoil something for you? Go for it. He's only in the movie four minutes. Fuck me. No, well, you're I can only afford to pay Paul Giamatti for four minutes of act of film time. Well, That's they said stuff. they said because I get bored at work a lot, so I watch. Uh, Seven web heads yes, you on uh, YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, I know. If if Tom, if if Sean Comer's not online, I get really. Bad. Um, <laughs> so no, nah, but they said that basically the opening scene where you know you see Paul Giamatti and everything, and he dons the suit after he's defeated. He's that's it, and he kind of gets put up, and it's basically just a gloss over introduction for when they do the Sinister Six. Uh, yeah, it kind of yeah. reminds me of uh, in the Ultimate Spider-Man video game to where you just defeat, I think it's like Electro and the Beetle. There's like two or three villains that just show up randomly and just kick their ass every time. <laughs> Pretty easy. <laughs> I really need to play Ultimate Spider-Man again. I haven't played that in years. Yeah, oh, I haven't either. played it. It's so easy, though. That's, it's I think really the only Spider-Man game that's what I she said. played was the team-up with... Uh, Old Super Nintendo, a team up with Venom and Spider Man. Oh, Maximum Carnage. Carnage. Oh, no, Separation yeah. Anxiety. Oh, yeah, I, that was... I didn't ever. Oh, I, never uh, Super Nintendo. I was like, I know, I know Maximum Carnage was on Super Nintendo because Jesse, even Jesse posted the game cartridge, which looked awesome. It was red. It was red. <laughs> yeah. It was special. I know. Everyone was easily, people were easier to entertain back then, <laughs> I assume. Sure. Which is not a knock. I still enjoy some of those games. Hey, I still play Street yeah, Fighter. We... On my girlfriend's, on my girlfriend's Super Nintendo, I, me and her still play Street Fighter too. 
Uh, you're a well done game, well done, no. oh, a well done game man. It stands up. She will cut actually, you. Mm-hmm. I actually have the uh, original uh, Spider-Man game for the Sega Genesis. I, I love that game. I, I can't. I think I've only beat it once by cheating with an emulator, but because <laughs> yeah. Kingpin's a lot of boss and he's a pain in the ass to beat. Too fast. <laughs> okay, right. hang on. Up is, is that, like, is that a good segue? Talk We're talking about the yeah, Kingpin? great segue. We go cool. seamlessly from topic to topic here, folks. But okay, let's yeah. let's kind of bring up Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of all crime. He's a, uh, I mean, everybody it seems tries to take him down at one point. If you're a street level, day to day kind of superhero, now I mean Iron Man or Thor, you know, the big names who deal with. Saving the Daredevil. world, they don't deal with it too much. But you get Daredevil or Superman or the Punisher. Kingpin is kind of the guy that they all wind up trying to take down at some point. So uh, since you kind of brought him up here, Ben, I'm just you know, what, what do you lo- what do you think about Kingpin? What do you like about him? Um, I like uh, basically he he grew into a role that was uh, you know set up in in earlier Spider-Man comics. Spider-Man comics have always been you know uh, deal a lot with you know street crime and organized crime and stuff like that. But, and there had always been, like, you know, this crime boss and that crime boss in the early comics. You got, you know, the big man and uh, crime master and, you know, lower-level guys like that. Kingpin was, like, the first big-time, you know, mob boss that, you know, that, that the part, that acted the part. And he was menacing, but he was also clever. And, you know, he, he you know, he was the guy, you know, pulling the strings behind the scenes. He You know, he could fight when he had to, but... Uh, for the most part, you know, he knew, you know, he was smart enough and rich enough and powerful enough to have a lot of goons doing his dirty work until, you know, until he had no choice but to but to fight. And, um, you know, not too many people re- uh, realize, like, he started out as a Spider-Man villain um, because he very quickly, you know, in the 80s, Frank Miller grabbed him and basically adopted him as a Daredevil villain, and kind of the rest is history. And he's had, those were great stories, too, but... His roots are were as a Spider-Man villain, you know, in the '60s, and it's also John Romita's favorite villain. John Romita's one of my favorite artists, um, and who created, you know, designed the Kingpin with with Stan Lee, and he uh, took the opportunity to include him in as many stories as he could. Right, uh, uh, Jason has informed. Hang on. Uh, sorry, Coop, I got to cut you off for just a second. Jason has informed me that it's yeah, about time for him to yeah. bow out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jason, any yeah, last uh, words you want? Uh, no, I'll, I'll leave everything uh, for um, Coop to cover plug-wise. Uh, me and Stinky Pete wish you all the best to finish on the show. We're going to go back. I get to play Kingdom Hearts. So the girlfriend's coming up. Make me play Kingdom Hearts because it's her favorite game, and she bought. she's going to steal my PS3 tonight because I bought it for her. So. Uh, that's that whip. No, 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 no. Hey, <laughs> booty call, okay? Booty call. Booty or duty? Booty. Both. Booty. Why not both? Hey, hey I'm going to give you the best words of advice you'll ever have in your life, Cooper. Yes, dear, is the two most important words in a relationship. <laughs> Regret, regardless. Well, but, guys, I appreciate well, I you guys. Uh, no, I, d- yes, I appreciate dear, you keep you guys having to repeat, up. I do. Exactly. Smile, nod, and say yes, dear. No matter what they say, yes, dear. But I appreciate right. you guys having me on. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and bow out, let you guys finish up. I'll download everything later. I'm pretty sure that with Benjamin on and Coop on, you guys got it covered. So, uh, like I said, I'll catch up with you when I download it. All right, Jason. Thanks for calling in. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. So, Coop, I stepped on your toes there. Uh, so oh. anyway, what you were saying about uh, the kingpin? So oh, I was I mentioned that he's a fat guy, <clears throat> but I also enjoy the fact that granted he's a fat guy, but at the same time, apparently that's all muscle. It is. <laughs> like that's, the dude, he looks overweight, but it's solid muscle. Is the storyline there? Yeah, which is funny because the way he's drawn, I'm like, no, that there's no way that body can be all muscle. Well, he's <laughs> but, not the blob. But still, yeah, he didn't eat anybody. Uh, Still gives me the heebie-jeebies. But yeah, the, <laughs> with uh, with with the kingpin, that's something I always enjoyed with him. Like you know, Spider-Man can try to bounce around him like a pinball, but more more often than not, he just bear hugs him. <laughs> it's an effective. It is. It is, unless it's modern wrestling when it's just a rest hold. Hey, a bear hug beat Hulk Hogan. 
Brock Lesnar did it with a bear hug. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Boy, the and then he smeared his finish. blood on him. He did that, that too. <laughs> if the chin lock could finish matches, Rand Champion. Let's not, let, let's, not, <laughs> let's not get into my hatred for Randy Orton, because we'll be here for um, we'll Randy be here all Boy. night. King Finn, he's awesome, though. I, I'd forgotten that he was originally a uh, Spider-Man villain first, because, you know, a lot of his prominent stories are with Daredevil. And he was in that movie. Where I had to argue with my mom that no, he was not. He's like, no, no, he was. <laughs> no, he was drawn white, but it didn't matter. And big ups to Michael Clark Duncan, the late Michael Clark oh, Duncan. Oh, was awesome. One of the, I mean, that movie is so kind of hit and miss. When Ben Affleck is not on the screen or Jennifer Garner is not on the screen, the movie's gold. <laughs> so, unless it's the director's cut. <laughs> and even then, it's marginally better. But yeah, he was awesome as Kingpin. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I thought he was. I thought he. Was, I remember I saw that movie. The, and I was like 12, so, yeah, I was like 12 when it was the 250 theaters. It's great. <laughs> yeah, he, right. he's a pretty cool. He was actually, I, I always remember him for the 90s show because he was a huge part of that show. Him and Smythe, the guy with the with the wheelchair and all the spider slayers. The spider slayers were so cool. Especially ones well, like one got destroyed. They built like three of them, and then they became a giant one. I remember that you had like the you had like a small spider, and then a bigger spider, and then a large one, and they all stacked on top of each other. And then when that failed, he turned uh, Smythe into a, like some sort of mutant spider slayer. But Jesus, this guy's more obsessed with killing Spider-Man than J. Jonah Jameson. Hey, was it? Didn't uh, Triple J use the spider slayers once he became mayor? Oh, I don't. Rem- I don't. I just forgot he became Something a man. Like, there's, there's, there's a story arc in that Superior Spider-Man that kind of deals with that. Not not exactly. It's more like Smythe is trying to break out of jail and at the same time like blackmail Jameson into into uh, allowing it. Um, I, I I haven't read that that particular story. It, it wasn't that long ago, but I haven't read it in, in a little while. Uh, Something like that. It's pre- it was pretty recent. It's from like last year. Uh, okay, yeah, I haven't read a new comic since 20. I was like, oh, so when you said Superior, Superior Spider-Man, I'm like, I don't remember that one. <laughs> yeah, J. Jonah Jameson is mayor of New York right now in the Marvel Universe, which oh, is kind Lord, of amazing. I'm, I'm fine wonderful. with it. Yeah, me too. That must hey, look, I, for as much as I liked uh, Jameson in the comics and everything, I absolutely fell in love with the character when I got to see J.K. Simmons do him in the film. He was perfect. I don't believe... I don't believe that that was J.K. Simmons. I think they found the real Jameson and just got him to play himself. <laughs> that was, you know, that was also kind of my awakening, my realization moment when I realized, hey, J.K. Simmons is an awesome actor. Because yeah. my exposure to him prior to that was as Vern Schillinger, the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood in the prison drama nice, Oz. Man. And he goes from Schillinger to... Jameis seamlessly, and they're such radically different characters. Jameis is such a troll in those movies. <laughs> my, my, kind my, of favorite, troll, yeah, my favorite meme from the internet was, uh, <laughs> it's like, hey, Parker, you know what my favorite brand type of rice is? And Peter's like, what? He goes, Uncle Ben's. Ah. <laughs> and yeah, they had that picture of him with the laughing face. <laughs> yeah. I remember that <laughs> meme. Oh, it's one of my favorites because I'm like, oh, that's that one. My favorite James <laughs> moment in that in in that movie. It's uh, I think Spider Man Two. Um, it's it's the joke that like you have to be a Marvel fan to get, and that's when they're trying to make, name Doctor Octopus, and they're like, you know, uh, what are you gonna call him? And and you know, to Sam Raimi's brother is like, you know, Doctor Strange. He's like, that's pretty good, but it's taken. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. When they're sitting there, a guy named Otto, and I do a horrible impression, but a guy named Otto Octavius winds up with four extra arms attached to him. What are the odds? What are we going to call this guy? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Octopus. Doesn't uh, they try yeah. to benchmark that, too? You're like, uh, I love Doc Ock. I lo- he, he's just like, Doc Ock, I love it. I love it. Then he looks at one of his interns and it says, like, go patent that. Or, <laughs> go patent that, yes. patent it so that he gets royalties when someone else refers to them as Dr. Ock. But, well, a quarter you know, that, every time says it. <laughs> but that, that leads us into Doc Ock, the current uh, superior Spider-Man, which for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Octopus has sw- was able to swap his mind with Peter Parker, and now you have Doc Ock's mind and personality in Peter's body, which has led us into the kind of on, the current ongoing, I believe. So, you know, let's right. kind of talk about Doc Ock for a while, because I never felt he, until, again, I was never the biggest fan of the guy, but until you had Alfred Molina show up on, in Spider-Man 2 and be one of the best parts of that movie, despite it being a very good movie, he's, his portrayal of, of Otto is 
one of the highlights, so that, that's kind of where my personal, like, oh, that, that's actually an interesting character comes from. I must have missed his origin story when I was watching the television show. So I'm just curious, you know, uh, so, you know, let's go, with, let's go with Doc Ock for a while. He's an interesting character. So, Cooper, where do you go with Doc Ock? He tried to marry Aunt May once. <laughs> Uh-huh. I think Isn't Jameson's away dad with it too. marrying Aunt May? Like Peter and Jameson are technically related? Oh, Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> Poor Aunt May. If she's, not, if she's not dead, somebody's trying to marry her. Aunt May mar- <laughs> actually married Jameson's father. That's what I thought. <laughs> oh, that's Peter. creepy. Peter and Jameson are like second cousins. Yeah. Oh, they're second oh, cousins. God. <laughs> and the first and the first thing Peter does during the wedding, which, you know, Jameson performs the ceremony, is Peter asks him for 50 bucks since they're related now, which was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's awesome. That's so Peter Parker. I love it to death. It's the best thing. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, I didn't know he almost beat Black Cat to death. That's great. No, yeah. But it's, it's actually funny. Apparently Spider-Man almost beat him to death. And then he got arachnophobia for a time. Yeah, he had arachnophobia for a time, and then apparently he died by saving Spider-Man. Yeah, like it's that's actually funny. You're looking at his uh, wiki page, I, I I would have thought he would have been a few more, uh, you know, quote unquote important story arcs. But then again, like I said, I really Spider-Man's one of those heroes. I feel like he's more episodic than a lot of other ones. Cause a lot of his good stories are just kind of contained within a few. I mean, he's a very important part of the Sinister Six. I'm pretty sure when he like the whole like uh, guy that got everybody together. Yeah, he's a founding member. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I Doc Ock that. was. Yeah, Doc Ock was kind of the mastermind that kind of brought everybody together. He formed the Sinister Six, which is also like the great comic to to read as the first Sinister Six story. For the art alone, it's Dick go at his best in the sixties. Yeah, that was um, it was Mysterio, Vulture, Electro, Doc Ock, Craven, and the Sandman. That's right. That's a solid lineup. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Doc like, Doc Ock, he was pretty cool, and it was great to see him in in the movie as well. He's pretty much like I would say like the second big villain. Like that's the guy. He's the guy after Green Goblin most people would recognize. So that Green Especially Goblin now. costume in that. Per- yeah. I was about to make a joke about the Green Goblin costume from the first movie and how it looked like it came out of something I should be watching on television. <laughs> <laughs> those of you who don't know, so those of you who don't know, Coop does a Japanese the folks uh, centric uh, Sentai Rider podcast here on the Rattles and Broadcasting Network, so that's where it's coming from. It's, it's Japanese Power Rangers. Literally. Literally, that's what it is. And it did look like armor from like one of those shows. It's like, hey, there's that Power Ranger. Yeah, it's funny. It's still a weird-ass costume. But then again, I guess it's not as weird as how the classic look would, the classic, uh, look, would look on a big screen. That would look interesting. But that does remind me. I just remembered... Did you ever hear, I'm sure y'all heard about the hoax in the 90s about the uh, James Cameron Spider-Man movie? Yeah. I vaguely recall that. I just I, I remember, remember, remember it well. That. It's been an old issue of Wizard. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. That is like the best hoax I've ever seen. It wasn't entirely a hoax. James Cameron at one point was going to make a Spider-Man movie. Oh. Um, it wasn't the one in the fake, you know, poster that they put in with it. Although I remember that one too, and that was hilarious. Um, it wasn't. It, it wasn't exactly like that, but he was definitely going to make one um, at one point. It's just the rights to the movie rights of Spider-Man were so all over the place in the '90s that uh, you know it, it just ended up never happening. Damn, they can never get the damn movie rights correct in the 90s until we got to the end. Where it's like, yeah, let's do an X-Men. Yeah, back to back to the, at least to the movies, like. The Doctor Octopus portrayal was really, really well done. They really he added a human element to him. Like he was, he was already a character that was had some humanity to him. But I don't think they ever really looked at it in a way that Sam Raimi and his writers did. With you know him being a, pr- a pretty nice guy overall, the, like the little arms had their own little minds of their own, and they get into his brain. Well, that was an interesting part about that movie in general for me. Was you know. I do this podcast. I love villains. I tend to dissect them, and that's where a lot of my enjoyment of films tends to come from. So looking at you know Alfred Molina's portrayal, he was very understated. He was very almost flat at times, and I don't mean that in necessarily that the man can't act. I mean he was performing very kind of flat at a flat pace deliberately, 
And it was the, subdued, and maybe? The, hmm. Yeah, yeah, subdued. And the arms each had their own kind of individual personality. They were the things that were more menacing than he was. And part of that might be because there was just so much CGI and digital and you know, digitization that went on in that film. But, you know, again, the, Doc Ock was never a character that really appealed a whole lot to me. And, but when Alfred Molina was up there, and the way they approached it, it all of a sudden became something that was interesting to me. And maybe that was, you know, me just finally having the aha moment. But... Yeah, a big part of why Spider-Man 2 is so successful and so well received and well thought of has to do with you know the villain and the villain being being up to snuff. I mean that one of my issues with the first one was like you know the costume for the Green Goblin and you know, William Defoe's a fine actor. He just wound up a bit too far overboard in some cases. I felt with Norman Osborn, but yeah, a little too much scenery chewing, which is not necessarily the. Yeah. I feel bad for the first two Spider-Man movies because that third one really ruined that entire, like, trilogy for so many people. Like, yeah, those movies weren't even any good. I'm like, dude, one was pretty good. Two was great. Like, that third one, man, it just, that sucks so much. <laughs> like, it wasn't it's not the worst movie ever, but it's probably one of the most disappointing movies because I was really looking forward to that. And then when I saw it, I was like, ugh. That was also the movie where... <laughs> That was also the movie where Kirsten Dunn stopped caring, which hurt it a lot. I'd say didn't. Yeah. In addition to her being there. Yeah. Well. So what? She's not that good of an actress. (laughs) Yeah, she's not awful. I didn't mind her in the first two. In the third one, she was intolerable. Yeah, she was. They also they also wrote her so poorly in that one. Well, yeah. We need to call in Mark for this one, just so he can. just, just so he can go back on that rant about how she's a perpetual child in those movies. Uh, that's such a good pot. Such a good <laughs> podcast. Though, uh, yeah, that actually was, those were very good. And it made me open my eyes to that fact. But uh, when I'm thinking about Doc Ogg, I just want to go, go and reference something when we were talking about video games. I don't know if you ever played the late the late 90s uh, PS1 N64 Spider-Man game. Yeah. Did play that one? I love yeah, it. Yeah, actually, I borrowed, I borrowed it from a friend of mine on N64, and he's never gotten it back. Oh well, I haven't <laughs> talked to the guy since. So. Well, I just ended up happening with people. Well, yeah, I just ended up borrowing things from people, and then they just like we never talked. We just stopped talking, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll give it to them. Yeah, that game was awesome. But actually, the final boss in that game, it's like 15 years old, so nobody should care. It, it's a mixture of uh, Doc Ock and Carnage, and, and it is very terrifying. But it's a bitch. It is a bitch of a final boss because you have to outrun him. Yeah, <laughs> it's very bad. You can't fight him at all. You just have to run and you have to, like, quick, you know, web swing all through some, like, corridors. It's it's one of the coolest, bo- like, final bosses I've ever played. Yeah, it was. And he was, he was cool. And that, that whole game was cool. But the N64 version suffered from the fact it didn't have cutscenes. It didn't? I didn't yeah, know I, that. No, nah, I played the PS1 version, so, yeah. Yeah, the N64 hmm. one was just comic panels because it didn't have enough... Uh, power and memory to get the whole cutscenes in there. Mm-hmm. Like, I love Venom mm-hmm. in that game. Call me spider <laughs> uh, uh Yeah, those uh, those games were great. I never played the second one. Hell, I didn't even know who Electro was at that time, because I'd only watched the cartoon, and he was never in the cartoon for some reason. No, we got more Shocker than Electro, as far as that went. Uh, yeah, Electro, I don't know why. Electro was in that animated series. They went so far off the rails with, his, with you know, how they brought him into that animated series. Like, I... It's, this is blasphemy for some people, but I never really liked the 90s Spider-Man animated series, but that was Ooh. one of the reasons why. Okay, I explain the difference. You know, with, Electro's going to be the big bad guy in the next Spider-Man movie, right. and Jamie Foxx doing an impression of the Emperor, right. apparently. <laughs> I'll get, I, I didn't get a chance to go on, off on Doc Ock, but I'll, I'll talk about Electro first real quick. Um, yeah, well, here's the thing, um, Electro is, there's not much to him in the comics, so I don't begrudge the movie, like, trying to make him a more grand villain than he is, because he wasn't that grand of a villain in the comics. A lot of Spider-Man villains tend to be, like, you know, goons or, uh, you know, just thugs that happen onto superpowers. Electro's one of them. Um, but... If I, if memory serves, like, in the animated series, it was this whole thing with, like, you know, this uh, dealing with something, whatever their equivalent of, like, the Third Reich was, and, and, and he was some, you know, prophesized or some 
you know, secret weapon that, you know, that, that the Nazis were going to use to bring about, you know, a new third right. Like, somebody, somebody who remembers that episode can correct me, but it was something like that. There was this huge story arc where, you know, and it, it turned out that Electro was, was the villain at the end and he was German for some reason. And I'm like, um, yeah, you lost me. Okay, uh, I've got the Wikipedia entry on it here, so I'm going to kind of go from this. Uh, Electro was, uh, he didn't, originally he didn't appear because James Cameron's Spider-Man movie featured Sandman and Electro, which is also why Sandman isn't in that particular cartoon. You have Hydro-Man. I mean, exactly. same character, basically, but... Uh, in, in this, yeah, you're, he was a, yeah, you're right. I'm just reading this entry and it's making me like, no... No, no. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's stupid. He's like a Russian who is masquerading as a German police officer who was experimented on by the Nazis. And, you know, there's only so much credulity you can stretch even in comic book lore, people. I and, know. okay, Pat Mullen has insisted I bring up the fact that Electro enjoys receiving anal, which he has discussed in the comics. <laughs> What comics what? was he? Sorry, what was that? What comics were he re- was he reading? I don't know. He's fan six. <laughs> Possibly, I'm just saying. Apparently, he brought it up during one of his prison stays, and I don't know, which would explain more why they cast Jamie Fox. But did Garth Ennis write that that comic? <laughs> I love Garth. I love Garth Ennis. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like something he would write? Like it really does. Like I read yeah. the first two pre, I bought the first two preacher comics, read it, and a day gave it to my friend, and he couldn't stop laughing the whole time. Yeah. So okay. Good. Apparently, uh, according to Pat, who is my source on this one, it says in an issue of Amazing Spider-Man, he explains how in jail he found out things about himself that he likes and that he didn't know. <laughs> so I'm assuming there was. So you know, now we've got now we're tag teaming Dude. Spider-Man with. Oz because he was sharing a cell without a BC and Schillinger, I guess. I don't know. Dude, I'm, I'm going to a convention next weekend. I'm going to find those issues. <laughs> please, <laughs> please do. I, uh, yeah, by all means. Uh, but apparently that also explains some of the costume. I don't know. <laughs> Just don't want what other people are telling me here as far as that one goes. All right, but you're right. Uh, we didn't get a chance to kind of talk about Doc Ock, Ben, so... What do you got to say about the eight appended? Um, real quick about the movie. Um, that was I I I enjoyed the hell out of Spider Man too. First of all, um, Doc Ock is really different in the movie than he is in the comics, so he's a little bit different than what I was used to. And even in most interpretations of him, you know, on TV and stuff, you know, he's much much more sympathetic in the movie than he ever was in anything else. Like in especially in the comics, for the most part. Doc Ock is a bastard. Like, he is the archetypical, you know, mad scientist, you know, obsessed with destroying the, you know, the hero. Um, But that's kind of what makes him a good villain. And, you know, recently, like, you know, his stock went up, you know, considerably the past couple of years because he pretty much succeeded where everybody else failed because technically he killed Spider-Man. And now he's running around in his body. Uh so they're they're doing a lot of they're doing a lot of really interesting things with Doc Ock right now. Um it doesn't sit right with everybody, but I still maintain like I, I love Superior Spider Man because I still maintain that Doc Ock is still the villain in that story. And it's basically just, you know, the story from the villain's point of view. And it's 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 all about, you know you know, Doc Ock his personality in, in Peter Parker's body and him Giving his interpretation, it's the villain's interpretation of what being a hero is about. He just gets it so wrong. It's really interesting. Well, so, yeah. I enjoy stories told from the villain's point of view. I mean, surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> given what, <laughs> given the nature of my podcast and everything. But I, I'm gonna have to catch up on Superior Spider-Man. See, you know, kind of get it, get my teeth into it, and see, because I've, I'm with you guys. I've heard kind of conflicting things, and that some people are. Not necessarily on board, but there are also people who just really hate change. And how dare you do anything different kind of type of mentality. Well, uh, it's already been established that Peter Parker is coming back this year, which everybody predicted because it was everybody. Nobody you know, nobody that knows anything about Marvel knows that, you know, really nothing bought changes. that he's going to stay Well, no, yeah, nobody really bought that Peter was going to stay dead. Um, so everybody was kind of predicting. 
which, you know, yeah, when the second movie comes out, then that's when he'll come back. And, you know, lo and behold, the second movie is about to come out, and he's coming back. So, uh, but it's, yeah. you know, if the story if the story that brings him back is good, I'm okay with it. It's no problem. And it's it's tough scene. Everybody comes back from the dead. It's how you do it. Well, Except Uncle Gwen Stacy. And Uncle oh, yeah, Ben. Well, 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 yeah, Glenn, Gwen Stacy was cloned. Didn't, uh, that doesn't didn't count. Dr. Warren had a, had a, have a clone of her? Yes, and she disappeared without a trace in the clone saga, never to be mentioned. Or her. And she just kind of walked <laughs> off and was never seen again. We're all just kind of... <laughs> That's true. But, yeah, so, I mean, apparently, like, Uncle Ben is the only one who never will, will get to come back. He, he, yeah, I've, I've not seen him. Not seen him come back yet. Like, Bucky, Bucky's alive. You know, Bucky, that was the other one that people... Ray. Uh, the two big ones, you know, the biggest ones for a long time, you had Bucky Barnes, uh, Gene Gray's death, Uncle Ben's death, and, you know, like, everybody else gets to come back, and poor Uncle Ben just yeah. still dead. Yeah, the, the poor Peter Parker, like, that dude, like, I know in the Ultimate Comics he's dead. <laughs> the six one six universe he's dead. Yeah, well, he did. Six one six universe he's dead. Like, Jesus, like, is it just kill part... Kill Peter like month or something? Uh, maybe I guess maybe they go, yeah, I guess maybe they just feel like since he's the everyman character, bring him back, he'll be fine. You know, <laughs> everybody, everybody will be happy. He'll be back to complaining about his rent in no time. <laughs> <laughs> right, that that only gets so far. I don't know. Oh well, at least the sister is not involved with this one. Not that we know. Of. We know. Oh um, God. Like, what do you bet Doc Ock a cool cast? Cast. I'm going to spoil this. What do you bet Doc Ock, Ock winds up having a change of heart and regretting what he did? He goes to Mephisto and says, undo this. That would be my jumping off point. Oh, <laughs> God. Mephisto was like, I thought he was such a cool character. And then well, he's the devil. He's like, the devil's an awesome and character. He's like, I, and he's like, I want one thing from you. And he's like, well, what's that? Your marriage. I'm like, really, Mephisto? I'm like, out of yeah, everything he, you could ask for, his fucking wedding ring. I've seen the robot devil in Futurama make better deals than that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you don't understand. Their love was so pure, its existence caused him physical pain. Oh, that's some bullshit. Some yeah, was, logic like that. He wanted their love, some. Was, their love was so pure that Marvel Editorial was trying to break them up almost from the moment that they married them off in the 80s. <laughs> Uh, and he would have gotten away with it too, but for those meddling kids and their dumb write-in campaign. Yeah, that was oh, a product Jesus. of the comic strip actually, because uh, Stanley married them off in the newspaper strip, so the comics uh, had to follow suit. They actually oh, did that's... like a mock, they did like a mock wedding ceremony at Shea Stadium in, in New York one time. It's, uh, it's you can probably find video if you uh, if you check YouTube. It's all over there. Uh, pretty, hey, at least they're doing better than Superman, who they couldn't marry them because they hadn't done it in Lois and Clark, so they said, fuck it, let's kill him. And then they did it again. <laughs> Jesus. I, I guess maybe the comics industry's on a downturn, so let's kill everybody. It's like Oprah with cars. <laughs> you get a death. You get a death. You get a death in a resurrection. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was like, when I was, I read comics from my freshman year of high school to my senior year of high school, so that's like, what, 05 to 20, uh, to around 2010. Yeah, so yeah, I was around there for when they, <laughs> with the one more day, my teacher was like, well, what do you think about that? Because I read comics in the middle of his class, I didn't give a fuck. And I was like, at the time, I was like, I don't think I like it, but you know, maybe something good will come out. And then when they killed Captain America, I was all torn up, and I didn't sell the comics on eBay like I should have, because now they're not worth the damn thing. <sighs> See, that's the sad part. Those things were going two fifty the day the day the, day the issue came out. I don't know. Well, of course, just they invest in the old back. stuff. No, nothing new was ever going to be worth all that much ever again. Just invest in the old stuff. Yeah. God, I'm, I need to move some of these comics out of here. That's the problem in my room, though. The rarest comic I have is Transformers number one. Woo! Nice. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, either that or Spawn number one. That's not worth a damn thing because everybody has it. Everybody. I've got two. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Actually, like actually, like Spawn. Most people don't for some reason because he's dark and gritty. And I'm yeah, really I've come to find out, I've come to find on the internet that a lot of people don't think Spawn's kind of shitty. But I'm like, I fucking love Spawn, so you can go fuck. It. But yeah, speaking of, uh, okay, <laughs> there's no transition from go fuck yourself. Tommy so, McFarlane. Next, 
McFarlane. Tom McFarlane started. The, Tom McFarlane cre- co-created Venom. There you go. Well, we can't True. talk about Venom. But, yeah, but if you want, we can talk a little bit about Venom. Well, I know that the thing about Venom is, it, since it came to refer to the symbiote and it possessed so many people. Well, I mean, ooh, you mentioned ooh, a scorpion. Yeah, you mentioned that beforehand. Uh, scorpion was one of the guys who had the symbiote for a while, and Scorpion's an interesting enough character. I mean. He was a was he a PI or a bounty hunter or something that uh, Jameson hired to hunt down Spider Man and the whatever gave him his powers wound up driving him insane. Yeah, that's right. Wow. He was a private investigator. Yeah, a really, he was, he was a really dumb one. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. Yeah, we want to try this so you can find Spider Man. Okay. What are the possible side effects? They include mania, insanity, death, dismemberment. Yeah, sounds good. Scorpion is diarrhea. Hi, right, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Hey. Yeah. Uh, was a, I didn't hear anybody. Um, were you talking about Scorpion now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Scorpion is mostly, Scorpion is not, you know, not a particularly interesting character by himself. I mean, he's pretty cool, and, and you know, there have been some pretty cool battles, you know, Spider-Man versus Scorpion battles, but as a character, he's pretty one-dimensional. His best. You know, the best thing about the Scorpion was basically, like, how, you know, his creation made Jameson, you know, that much more of, you know, that much more of an interesting quasi-villain because, you know, Jameson finding, you know, the the research and the scientists, you know, that ended up uh, doing the experiment that created him. And, you know, that whole story revolves around the idea that, you know, uh, you know, and created an even bigger menace than, you know, he, he could ever, you know, than he ever could accuse uh, Spider-Man of being. And he actually comes to realize that, at, you know, at the last minute. And he flip-flops about that pretty quickly afterwards. But it's like, a, you know, it gives him that rare moment of clarity, like, wait a minute, you know, maybe I'm taking this too far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've noticed that's, like, the problem with a lot of the, some of the smaller villains in uh, Spider-Man. Like, you remember them because... The suit design's kind of memorable, and they got some cool powers, but a lot of them are... Yeah. Which, I mean, it's fine, because, you know, I remember Shock. I don't remember what what he does. I you remember he was vibrating a, gauntlet. Well, no, I, I, I said I remember when I know what he does. I didn't mean, like, what he does, like, power-wise. I just meant, like, in the comics, like, yeah, whatever. Well, he, it's kind of like, uh, you know... Um, you know, Robert, you, you said something uh, when you were talking about the Joker. You were saying, like, Batman villains have, like, you know, there's the Joker, and then you've got, you know, the next level of A-list villains, and then you got the B and C-list villains. Spider-Man is a lot like that. He's got, it's more like, you know, you got A-list villains, and then you kind of have A-minus list villains, and then you got B and C and D and God help you. You've got the Gibbon and the Grizzly, which are somewhere at the bottom <laughs> of the alphabet. Oh no! Oh yeah, and the White Rabbit. See, see, Jesse put a very, very fun uh, article here on the home game: twenty-five most obscure uh, Spider-Man villains. Yeah, uh, got some. I think I've read that. Scarecrow. Shit, I forgot about Scarecrow. <laughs> Apparently, there's a there's a squid as well. Since we yeah. have a yeah. and everything else. Oh god. Yeah. Do you play don't, don't go anywhere near those. Oh squid! What? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to know. You really don't want to know. I have that comic. Yeah, the great job one here is what's making me laugh my ass off. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, apparently it's, uh, it's one of the twins that Norman Osborn and Gwen yeah, Stacy yeah, had one together. Of the, uh, one of the illegitimate <laughs> children that Norman, that Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy had. That is that is one that was on J. Michael Straczynski's watch that I really can't defend. No, you can't. Oh, who do that we have was, here? I will I'll defend... I will, I'll try to defend this. His original idea was that it was not that it was the children of um, Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy, but Peter and Gwen Stacy, which would have been a lot more interesting. But yeah. uh, once again, once again, you know, Marvel does not want Spider-Man to grow up and have kids and change in any significant way. So that was that was the okay, alternative. That would have been awesome. Yeah. I mean, damn! Like, can you imagine all the psychological torture they can give him? <laughs> that was that was the alternative. The alternative was, you know, in, you know, instead of giving Spider-Man kids, let's have Norman Osborn rape his girl, and then it was consensual. Uh, and the, it was, it was story, consensual. I think they were in a rage, but yeah, I mean, it's just I don't know. Like when Osborn did that, it just he went from like kind of a cool character to, or I guess kind of a cooler villain to just like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> that that's kind of almost like comically like 
nasty. Jumping the shark. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it's kind of short. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, th- I think it would have been a lot better if that would have been Peter and Gwen's because then he would have had to cope, come to the terms of, oh, these kids I have. Because I've, I've noticed that. I guess maybe the reason why I never really think of any Spider-Man stories is because really it's all about Spider-Man. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, it's more about him as a guy and him overcoming things than, like, the villain. I should I say, to- like, like, if I can rattle this off really quick, um, a lot of the a lot of the biggest, you know, most, prominent villains that are still being used today in Spider-Man comics were a product of, of literally the product of the first two years of the comics existence. This is like, you know, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko at their creative peak. And literally it would be one issue after the other, introducing a new villain from like the very beginning. So like the first yeah. 25 issues, which, which is the first two years of the comic, roughly you've got, hold on, I got the list here. You got, Jameson, Chameleon, Vulture, Tinkerer, Dr. Octopus, Sandman, The Lizard, Electro, The Enforcers, Mysterio, Green Goblin, Craven, The Scorpion, and then The Spider Slayer at issue 25. So that's that's the first two years of Spider-Man. Those, that villain, every single one of those villains is still around somewhere or another. Huh. That's actually incredibly interesting because cause just looking through all these shitty villains here, quote unquote <laughs> shitty, I guess. Thank God, some of these like the only ones I would reckon was like Tombstone, but that was because he he was in a few pretty awesome episodes of uh, the animated series, like the one where we actually gave uh, Robbie, the the guy that worked at the Daily Bugle, some uh, some character development. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Those, yeah, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah, I've noticed uh, there's uh, through my times on the internet there there actually are some flaws in the nineteen the ninety series that I never noticed. <laughs> that's uh, animation one. Like animation, especially animation was apparently. <laughs> oh well. Uh, that, here's the thing about that. You know, that '90s Spider-Man series had to compete with X-Men and Batman at the same time, and there was oh. no animation-wise, there was no way. Oh, well, there was, these cities are. <laughs> I love those two shows just as a study in contrast, because you have X-Men that strove to be a lot more realistic, and then you have this kind of stylized Art Deco that you get out of. Batman the animated series and I mean I enjoy both series but just the way they contrast with each other is just uh, for me at least is really was really fascinating. Yeah, cuz you look at like X-Men did a lot of adaptation to a lot of uh stories of the time and in the past. And I, I always look at Batman as they did mostly their own thing. And that's I Well they came, well they had their own version of Doctor Free or Mr. Yeah, Freeze. Actually, I mean he, he be so the, game. that version of it that version of it was so good that the comics ended up adopting pretty much that <laughs> origin from the animated series. Yeah. Yeah, they like read that, like before he was, like yeah, before he was just a guy with a cold gun and then after that he became a tragic character. Uh, Paul Dini well, they had, brilliant bastard. They, had, they adopted uh, Harley Quinn too. She started in their animated series and then moved into the comics because she was so popular. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that show is so good. But that's a podcast for another day. <laughs> yeah, when, we, when I get back to Batman, we will be discussing that at yeah. length. Oh yeah, all right. So uh, I can talk about that series for hours. Uh, all right, Ben, have we, uh, have we not hit anybody that sticks out in your head? Oh, we haven't talked. We haven't touched on Hobgoblin. Oh, the Hobo Goblin. Oh yeah. That, all right, Ben. Go ahead and give us uh, your your feelings on the Hobgoblin there. Um, I like Hobgoblin a lot. Um, I like the fact that they they kind of tried to recreate and 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 amp up the uh, the mystery, like the you know who is the Goblin type of mystery. Because what not too many people realize is uh, the original Green Goblin. Um, nobody knew his identity until you know a few appearances, you know, a few times after he appeared, and it was revealed to be. Uh, Norman Osborn, which was a whole other thing that, you know... That Didn't was they, a lot they originally going to go a different way? Um, I, yeah, I was talking about this uh, before in, in another podcast. Um, Steve Ditko actually wanted the Green Goblin to be revealed as somebody that had never been seen before um, because, you know, that that's just kind of how he viewed things. Like, you know, there, there's, there is no coincidence and it's not always necessarily a person you know. He tried that with his previous story, and it didn't go over so well. So when it came time to do it for the Green Goblin, Stanley was pretty much like, you know, there's no way. This has to be dramatic, and it has to be somebody that we've seen before. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, the fans are going to want to kill us. Um, so I think they did the right thing with that. They tried to do something similar with the Hobgoblin, 
where, you know, uh, you never see his face, you never really know who he is, and when you think that you know who he is, because of the very first, um, I think actually the second Hobgoblin story, he's unmasked, but it's not really him. It's, you know, one of his one of his hired guys. Um, and it was a whole thing where the original writer, uh, Roger Stern, had this whole grand plan for how he was going to reveal who the Hobgoblin was, but then he ended up leaving Spider-Man before he could reveal it. So... Other people, uh, you know, other writers ended up revealing it as somebody that he didn't intend it to be, and he ended up having to re- retcon that much, much later on. I think, you know, within the past 10 years, he wrote the story that he wanted it right with who the Hot Dublin really is, and now they've run with that. But, um, you know, at first it was all about the mystery. It was all about, you know, this, uh, you know, this new goblin, and he's stolen all of Norman Osborn's technology and made it better. And you know, uh, now, you know, the, he's trying to do what the Green Goblin tried to do at first, which has become, you know, a big time, you know, figure in organized crime, and uh, you know, make a name for himself. And he's got to kill Spider-Man to do it. You see, that's the one obstacle. And really, with the Hobgoblin, it was all business. It was, it was never personal which uh, put a new angle on it, too. I have to imagine that would almost be refreshing, you know, when you have all of these guys and they keep, you know, when you've been around for so long, when you've been around and had as many interactions as you've had between Spider-Man and Green Goblin or Doc Ock or any of the other, to get to get a character that just does not care about him personally, isn't interested in who he is or any of that, just, no, I wish to run my organized crime unit and make as much money as possible. I, that's right. almost got to be a refreshing change of pace. Well, it was. You know, at the time, in, in the 80s, this was, you know, th- this was the type of stuff that, you know, people still wax nostalgic about Spider-Man, you know, in the 80s. It's that whole run, you know, with with the Hobgoblin and the mystery of who he is and, you know, uh, and he was, and he just had like a badass look. You know, he he appropriated you know all the Green Goblin technology, but he he had his own look to him, well, his own didn't sense Todd of menace. Did Todd McFarlane draw that? The original that like, was, Goblins and Hobgoblins, and that early Todd McFarlane? That was, no, that was John Romita Jr. It's one of my heroes. Uh, okay. John Romita Jr. Uh, uh, designed the uh, Hobgoblin. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's like kind of the, the very first issue, the very first appearance of, Ho- of the Hobgoblin, and I, I guess Jesse's playing along with us. He should be able to find this cover. It's the coolest image. It's just, you know, the Hobgoblin, you, you can't even see his face. The face is, is shadowed by the hood. And it's, <laughs> it's so badass. It's, him, it's an That's image him of him ripping Spider-Man the Spider-Man apart, right? costume in half. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I found it, so that is awesome. Yeah, so that's the first thing you see. You don't even know what it's about and what's going on. You find out, you know, what's going on by the end of that story, but that's all you have to go on. And, you know, all you see is, you know, it's a new goblin, and we haven't seen a new goblin since, you know, Norman Osborn died. So you have no idea what this guy is, what he's about, what he's doing, and, you know, what his angle is, and it's it got you right there. It's a great image and it's a great tease to you know suck you into into the comic and then the story was great on top of that all right uh anything that he hasn't touched on that you wanted to coop as far as hobgoblin oh all of it i thought damn bad ass so so i did not know deadpool played the hobgoblin one that's funny (laughs) this is after escaping escaping the hostess hostess deadpool was hired by the wizard to bomb a hangar dressed as a hobgoblin Deadpool mentioned he disliked the costume, and after he having bombed the wrong hangar, he never wore it again. <laughs> that is a story you can only do with Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, work with anybody else. No, not no. really. Oh, man. Deadpool's so awesome. But they, but for a while, they were really, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were really stretching him kind of thin. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's so badass. And the Hot Goblin's awesome. I, I definitely remember him from the from again the nineties, you know, that's where a lot of like my early memories came from. That is like, one of the up, things sorry, go ahead. I was just saying in the in the nineties show he ended up being rich girl Felicia Hardy, her her boyfriend or some or fiance or something like that was the hobgoblin. I thought yeah. that was actually I thought that was a pretty cool way of integrating like that character in with all the other stuff. It was interesting. And let, oh, Mark let Hamill. Me, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about. It. Yeah, Mark Hamill voiced them. That was that was one of the few things I really loved about that series. Actually, across the board, that's one of the few things I really loved about that series is, is the the voice cast was awesome. The voice cast was damn near perfect. 
That's about the only thing. The only thing it was missing was J.K. Simmons and J.J. Jonas. Yeah, it has there. Which is what he does yeah. now for the Spider-Man con. Doesn't he do that now? Like, he was I'm so good sure. at it that he has now taken over kind of some of the voice roles. Or at least for the movies, I, for some of the animated movies, he's done it. Oh, no. I have no, I have no doubt. Yeah, I like Steve that. Bloom. They found out Steve Bloom was so good at Wolverine. The dude pretty much voices Wolverine for everything now. Oh, he's cool. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to like see if I can find that on YouTube now because Mark Hamill's voice acting is... <sighs> that guy reinvented his career doing voice acting and not just with the Joker, even though he does an awesome Joker. But that's it. All right, so there anybody that we haven't touched on that you want to touch on yet, Ben? Uh, looking at my list right now. Um, I think we covered all the... Al- Actually, we didn't... We didn't- we didn't catch uh, the lizard. That's about the only oh. a like really a list guy that's, uh, and that's another pretty tragic figure. Is uh, you Dr. know, Dr. Kirk Connors. Yeah, Poor guy a... lost his arm. Decided he wanted it back. Spliced reptile DNA because reptiles will regrow things like tails and mutated. Yeah, he's a very. My understanding, he's a very tragic character. It's also another good example of Stan Lee's. Uh, you know, science will do whatever I say it does. You know, when you're trying <laughs> to create a villain. <laughs> yes. Excelsior. But you know, you, when it's this when it's this cool, you, you don't care one bit, but it's, you know, it's super science. You know, as long you know, my thing with that and this goes for a lot of, you know, various mediums, as long as you don't insult my intelligence, I'll go with you. If you give me an sure. excuse to follow your logic, I'm there. And if you want an example of this that is a completely different discussion, but snakes on a plane. They at least made the effort to ex- – hang on, not a great movie. They made enough effort to say, okay, here's how they got on, here's why they're behaving differently than they would normally. That I'm Okay, I'm willing to go with plenty of other problems with that movie, but when that you movie, make – Go ahead. No, that, movie, that, that movie was actually more entertaining than it had any right to be. It actually started sucking the moment that all the snakes got sucked out of the plane. Yeah. And so. – not because they had Keenan landing the airplane. That didn't help. That's, yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, but no, I, oh. I'm with you. I enjoy it, but again, it's one of those, it's, you know, just if you give me enough of a reason to believe, I'll follow you there. Just don't do anything stupid or jarring. And Stanley was good at that, by and large. You know, none of yeah. it was realistic, but it made enough sense within its own universe to be plausible. And that's all you can ask for when you're dealing with the fantastic. Sure. Like, yeah. I'm just. I'm curious, since we're talking about the lizard, did you enjoy the uh, Jonathan Rice Davies version that we, or Davis version that was seen in the Spider-Man? Did you enjoy his vision of you know, his version of Spider-Man or was or of the lizard? The lizard specifically? Um, yeah. Nah, I, I, I thought it was eh, he was it wasn't that great of uh, that great of uh, there was more that they could have done with it. Um. I think they they kind of underachieved with that because they spent a lot of time focused on uh, Spider Man and so and re- and retelling the origin which they really didn't need to do. But I, I for the most part I enjoyed that movie, but the the lizard was kind of a weak villain to use for it. And kind of a wasted opportunity too, from what I understand. Like we, like we just mentioned, he's a tragic character, and that doesn't really come across as much as maybe it should. And this is one of the reasons I've kind of come around to Mark Radulich's point of view on origin stories, and that some of them you don't need to retell. Everybody knows how Batman became Batman. Everybody knows how Spider-Man became Spider-Man. We don't need to see the origin every time we get another, get get an opening, an opening movie in a franchise. I, w- I would say, you know, I wouldn't have had a problem with them redoing the origin if they hadn't have done it absolutely as perfect as they could have done it in any in, in movie form with the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Like, I don't, that was about as good as it got as far as retelling Spider-Man's origin. So they weren't going to top that with, with this movie. They they went so far away from it that it just seemed pointless and it wasted a lot of time. And that movie actually picked up a lot when they got all of that stuff out of the way, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, when when yeah, we're not I retelling thought... things everyone knows, the story improves. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, I thought the, like, the lizard in that movie, like, I actually liked the character and it kind of did make sense why he was doing everything. But once he became, like, I want to turn everybody into lizard. I was like, that doesn't make much sense character-wise. Like, I, I get it, but it's kind of a far leap from him to go to, uh, you know, I want to regrow my arm to I want to destroy the world. I mean, yeah, I'm sure turning into a lizard can make you be a little crazy, but I don't think it 
is turning everybody into lizards crazy. I think he, he had this it? sort of. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Um, the way I, I look, the way I got what I got from the movie was he uh, he had this sort of lizard, you know, human hybrid master race type of mentality, uh, like you know that type of thing. Like you know, this will make the human race better. That's kind of what I got out of it. I could be wrong. Uh, I I haven't seen that. Actually, I haven't let I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> good worth it. It's actually it's a good movie. Eh, I just haven't got around to of great many movies that I probably should have seen by now that I have. But yeah, Peter yeah. Parker is kind Spider-Man of a three. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a smart ass and a bit of a hipster and a little bit of a douche. But you know, it's realistic. <laughs> That's one thing. I was like, hey, he kind of does act like a teenager would nowadays. A smart ass hipster. What, what people don't remember about those original Spider-Man comics, that's actually a pretty good characterization, a pretty yeah. accurate characterization of Spider-Man, like in the early days, because he was kind of, um, you know, he was kind of offbeat, and even after he got the powers and he started coming into his own, you know, he could be kind of a jerk, and he actually had to work at being a good person, and, um, you know, he had issues with authority, you know, he rubbed people the wrong way, and you know he wasn't—he wasn't as nice a guy as people remember him to be. He—he uh, he really, you know, that—that's what made. I think that's what another thing that made Peter Parker relatable back in the day was that you know he was a guy that was a good person, but it didn't come naturally to him. He actually had to work at it. Yeah, that and I, I felt like the, in that movie it was a little, I guess, more realistic to modern times because. Uh, because like how he was in the '60s comics, like I don't, I haven't met many kids like that ever. Like you know, in modern time, you know, like the science whiz is always like attached to the lab, and I never, never met those kids. So I was like, ah, yeah, this, I felt like it was a little more realistic. But I mean, the the Sam Raimi verse is still pretty, pretty solid. I could dig it. Go F go. We <laughs> finally got the costume perfect now. Now they got the costume right, and hey, look, he actually has to make his web cartridges instead of it being randomly part of his mutation. <laughs> yeah. That, that was the one that thing that kind of bugged me about those. It was like, no, because I remember, no, he had to make his own web being material. It wasn't. You know, he he got jumping, he got strength, he got clinging to walls, but he couldn't shoot his own. You know, that was he either had that from the. Venom symbiote in the black suit, or from his own uh, the things he created. Yeah, didn't uh, uh, Stan Lee say the reason he did that is so it would add, it could add he could add in dramatic tension any time? Like, oh no, he's almost out of web. Oh crap, I ran out. <laughs> yeah, but that became a gigantic crutch after a while. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of why he made it. <laughs> it. Became such a horrible plot device that every other issue he was running out of web fluid. So, well, then I guess when you're spinning so much web, yeah. Every, at, Every episode ended with a cliffhanger of, oh, crap, he's falling and he's out of webbing material. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, we're down to the last five minutes or so of live time. And, all right, so you, we hit the lizard, which is the other one you mentioned. Anyone else, uh, you know, lower level, upper level, Benjamin, that you wanted to touch on even just kind of mockingly before we start wrapping up? Uh, I have to, with the little bit of time I got left, um, maybe the vulture. Uh, who's kind of, oh, I think, kind of underrated. How'd I forget about the Vulture? Well, he said so yeah. different. That's the other thing about the Vulture. I mean, I'm going to try and remember. Wasn't one version, like, uh, kind of a, uh, politely a knockoff of, like, uh, the mate, you know, Sykes, from, uh, not Sykes, Fagan from uh, Oliver Twist? He, he, like, ran a ring of orphans underground who did his criminal bidding? Or am I misremembering? I don't remember that. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, that might be hang something on. I haven't read before. And hang on. I'm going <laughs> to... I There's a good chance I'm going to look up kind of his bio. So I've got a bunch of Vulture issues that I haven't read yet. So I'm Okay. I, I might be wrong, too. I've been wrong before. It happens. Oh, God. There's a new Vulture? Yeah, there's, a, there's different versions. <laughs> is, is that just the stuff of your nightmares? Humans eating other humans? Uh, it's just in comics if it's not... Like, the one with the blob just pissed me off. It was from the ultimate, like, the ultimatum when they were killing all the... The ultimate universe and the blob was eating the wasp. Like, yeah, that, was, that, that, that... I was just like, Ugh. Like, that's, yeah. that's just one of those, like... That always just gives me the heebie jeebie point of Yeah, that, that story was and pretty sad. That, that's why I was making the Jeff Love joke, because that man just pooped on me, like... Pretty much the entire Ultimate Z. God, Ultimate Three was so bad. Yeah. Ugh. And I, and I right. love Ultimate. So, uh, all right. So, what about Vulture? Was it that? Yeah. Okay. I've looked up. I believe I'm mistaken as far as my. 
I yeah. misread. Mis- or, you know, so, Benjamin, you brought him up. Let's hit on the Vulture. You know, what, what is it about him that you like? Um, Just that uh, they, he kind of – it's a guy that, like a lot of other Spider-Man villains, he's, you know, he starts off as a petty crook, but they actually gave him a pretty good backstory that plays up on the fact that, you know, he's an older guy that's, you know, playing supervillain. That uh, you know his you know he was an inventor. His technology was stolen out from under him. He was made to look like you know kind of a senile old fool. You know he ends up you know getting revenge on his business partner, and uh, you know turns to crime. You know he uses an event you know the invention you know, the, the vulture invention, which is an electromagnetic flying harness. You know once again super science. Um, but you know he, he, it's a guy who kind of grew into the identity that he you know that he started off with you know that he's he's a scavenger and he's you know uh you know he can he even considers himself you know pretty you know a pretty low uh you know loathsome person and he's cool with that yeah. uh right, coop anything you got on the vulture uh, I don't have much on him I just remember he was a guy with a pretty cool suit <laughs> I never read well, I don't you think know, I've read many uh, vulture comics character design goes a long way. All right. Oh, okay. Who's the other guy, member of the Sinister Six? I'm going to look up the picture here. We're missing uh, just Sandman? one. Oh, we haven't said Sandman either. Mysterio, that's the one I was thinking. Yeah, but we didn't do Sandman. And I actually have one that we've all forgotten, but I'll wait. Okay. I don't know. Who, who have we forgotten? Morbius the Living Vampire. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my... Again, my unfortunate first exposure was I need plasma. The plasma. Uh, I, plasma's yeah, 90... That... Water. Oh, yeah, that's, hey, hey. that's another thing that made me hate the animated series. They could, there were certain words that they couldn't say. Hey, I learned things about the human body that I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was part of blood. <laughs> Flaws, blood. That and the damn laser pistol still. Uh, that was yeah. like, yeah. like, like all 90s animated series couldn't do, like, they didn't show real gunfire. They were crappy lasers. It was like, no. Oh. Well, except I, don't, I think Batman got to use guns, didn't they? That, yeah, that you know, with with impunity, the cops use guns, the crooks use guns, and Batman, yeah, everybody used to but shoot guns. Except, too. except Batman, who did not need firearms. Batman's so awesome; he doesn't. He'll ne- he never needs guns. That's right. Because if he did, he'd be. <laughs> yeah, the only time he used is... the firearm was beating uh, Darkseid. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, Morbius was anyway. awesome. Okay, so you want so you want to talk about Morbius, the new vampire? You know the you know the vampire. You, didn't he? And I, I'm not as him on the, in the realm of the comics, so I'm going to defer to your expertise on this one, Coop. Um, I was actually uh, thumbing through his character biography just to make sure I got everything. Uh, apparently, he. Uh, I remember he well, was, uh, became a he hero. Off as like an, doesn't he like start off as an exchange student who just has a rare blood disease that he keeps trying to cure himself of? And it goes horribly uh, wrong? That's the animated the actual, series origin. I'm not sure how close it is. Yeah. Let's okay. See. He was attacked by the lizard and defeated in Spider-Man and those drunk forces. Yeah, he was a biochemist who was trying to cure blood using vampire bats and electroshock therapy. <laughs> and he made him into a sado- pseudo-vampire. Oh, yeah, that was a thing. Yeah, he actually uh, had a few series of his own, which is, I only knew about one of them, which was uh, in the 90s. <laughs> what a surprise, right? He became part of the, the whole Midnight Suns, which was, I think, him. I'm not sure if Blade was in that, but I know the eight in the 90s Ghost Rider, Dan Ketch. So he was he was in the Midnight Suns. And the accident, look at he is a really badass-looking cover that's so 90s-tastic. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, the glow in the... Is, oh, hmm? what? I think he asked if it glows in the dark. Oh, that's what I thought. I can't actually tell. But I remember a buddy of mine let me borrow some comics once that were uh, like Batman and Dead Man, and they gl- glowed in the dark, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Mind you, I was in eighth grade, so it makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, Mor- Morbius, I always thought he was really cool. He was, I think he's almost, he's kind of unique with Spider-Man's villains, because, you know, Spider-Man doesn't fight many vampires. <laughs> Last time I checked, vampires aren't usually his realm of, uh, you know, battling. Uh, we always found him unique, and I thought he was really interesting, especially because he had a life beyond Spider-Man. Hell, I don't think a lot of people remember he was in Spider-Man if you don't remember Plasma. I need Plasma! <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah, oh, God, it really... Uh, hey, it's almost as bad as... uh was it the 90s Silver Surfer cartoon where Thanos worshipped chaos? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That wasn't good, but everything else about that show was awesome. I just knew he, I didn't want to get to watch it, but I remember 
chaos. That, that, really anime, that, was, that show, that, that show it, the animation style alone, that was like a living Jack Kirby comic, so I I couldn't get enough of that show. I was so sad that like, it only lasted a few episodes. Yeah. I think that one was pretty cool. I never watched much of the Fantastic Four one. I think the only Marvel uh, car- cartoon that I never even gave a chance was the Avengers one. Do you remember the you show? Was wrong. The, the Avengers one from like 2000 where they had the damn suits or something. I remember that one. Is that yeah. Earth's Mightiest Heroes? Am I thinking no, of no, no, that? Oh, okay. No, this one was so this one was from like 2000. Uh, yeah, I remember, remember the one. At it. it was on Fox. The team was led by Ant Man. It didn't have Captain America or Thor or Iron Man because they were con- <laughs> they'd be able to get in spin off shows. <laughs> yeah, so that it was like Ant Man. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that one. I was like, yeah, that one went. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty lame. Yeah, it was. Spider-Man Unlimited. I like solid. Spider-Man Unlimited. I'm like the. I, I'm glad somebody to have somebody else that doesn't hate that show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen it, it, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't get to watch much of it, but I liked it for what I saw. It was fine. Yeah, I kind of. Yeah, I mean, there's. Nineties was a good time for superhero cartoons. Like we got some good ones now, but not nearly as many. That and cartoons no, as a whole is kind of. Become kind of eh, like I'll watch. It. Anyways, I think that's all for my my pick. Right. So we have. Who do we have left? Sandman and Mysterio. Sandman and Mysterio to round out the Sinister Six. And then I think that's sure. all of them that we're going to touch on. So, well, let's go with Sandman since he also got a big screen version and was one of the few good parts I felt about Spider-Man 3. It was better in the book. Well, that's almost universally the, true. Yeah, I read the novelization. It was, I felt like they gave him a lot more backstory, like a lot more stuff with like his daughter or something. I like it. Because I was, I was expecting to see it in the movie and did not see very much of it. Yeah, that so subplot in that subplot in Spider-Man Three with his daughter just dropped off the face of the earth after like the first forty-five minutes, didn't it? Uh, it's like, okay, here's here's uh, the reason he feels the need. He feels compelled to rob because he has to pay for his daughter's medical expenses, and then it never gets mentioned again. I mean, does she die halfway through, and then we're just he's just on a crime spree out of grief? I mean. Just, uh, uh, Maybe. It was an in, it was an interesting bit of story that could have been developed and was just dropped because why not? Yeah, it should have been developed more. Like that would have made him like ten thousand times better. But no, we had to focus on Eric Foreman. <laughs> Sorry, I should not yeah. look at Venom and imagine Kurtwood Smith going, "I'm going to put my foot up your ass." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I watch. You're going to kill me for st- saying this, but I just watched RoboCop for the first time a few weeks ago. I'm not gonna get mad at you for saying that. Everybody yeah, watched yeah, it. I loved his. Ver- I loved him in that, and well, it made the fact it took me twenty. Eh, it took me a while, uh, but you know the fact so, that I look at um, Clarence Boddicker Kurt, and I only get hints of Red Foreman, and he's still a badass. Every every time I see Kurtwood Smith, like I was watching it with my buddies, and every time he talked, I go dumbass. <laughs> I'm going to have to disagree with you, Bob. <laughs> can I like... Uh, that's, uh, my favorite foot in the ass was the one from the last episode. Can I light like these fireworks off in your house? Can I light like my foot in your ass? Uh, my favorite, the old foot in the ass. Yeah, it's, why he didn't get a spinoff show going into the 80s was just kind of, I think, a missed opportunity. You know, l- Leave everyone else. Just have Red open up an auto parts store in... Even in a could even be in the same city, but moving into the '80s, he runs an auto parts store and have him deal with kids making '80s references and him just still being crotchety and pissed off. It'd still be I, better than Johnny Loves Chachi and probably better than that '80s. Probably, is, uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> be better than New. You know, I never got the appeal of that show. I'm like, oh, Zoe Deschanel is adorable. A single app, I'm like, she's there's... adorable. I like, like her oh. sister better. And she opens her mouth. I take them both. I'm hard. I take them both. I'm hardcore. Well, Emily's at least oh. talent. Zoe's and she talented. was in Spider-Man 2. And she was in Spider-Man 2. Was yeah, she in Spider-Man 2? She was what? in Spider-Man 2 for like five seconds. Who was she? So was Joe uh, the At the very beginning, she was the receptionist that Peter delivers the pizza to. Oh. Well, yeah. there, there we go. That's how many times I've watched that movie. <laughs> I've seen that movie Picking up some years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just have never got a new girl. Sean, Sean's like, yeah, new girl's pretty good. I'm like, eh. I think Zoe Deschanel no, is adorable. And all. Dude, Look, I've been watching Brooklyn Nine Nine though, and Brooklyn Nine Nine is amazing. I'm about to drop it because I hate Andy. <laughs> Dude, I marathon. See, I actually, I like Andy Samberg. He's fun. Uh, you I know, marathon I'm that entire. Everybody. 
Yeah, everybody's comedic sensibilities are different. Yeah, all right, and before we go, Donner, too much for straight man is the greatest casting of all time. Just saying. I might have to give. I might have to give you one that. last thing on uh, one last thing on Sandman before you move on. Like I, I will say. That is that that was you say like that's one of the few good parts of Spider Man three. I'd argue it's the only good part of Spider Man three because that's where all the money went. That transformation <laughs> like, like when he when he's first transforming into Sandman and Oh, and, uh, I love that. I love that the way that brilliant. that is that was fantastic. I love that to death. Like I wish the rest of the movie would have measured up to that. Because that was a great <laughs> effect and that's where the budget went. I'm telling you, like after that, it drove off a cliff. But it certainly that, didn't go to the writing. That movie had me with that with that moment with that scene. The movie had me, and I was like, okay, this is in good hands. And then uh, James Franco shows up again, and, you know, and then he becomes Harry. And then he becomes Harry Osborn, burn victim. He becomes Two Face, apparently. Something like that. Uh, but yeah, Sandman, the he's a cool character. With Alfred, uh, shows in the error of his way. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one time where him and Hydro Man got mixed up. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was Hydro Man in the television in the eighties in the nineties television series. Yeah, because Sandman was going to be in James Cameron's movie. He was yeah, a character think, in the comic too, though. Yeah, yeah, he was. I think the two of them uh, got mixed up and became a yeah, yeah. He, he's a real thing, but I think they become like became a mud monster or something. I remember that? That sounds interesting. I mean, yeah, I, like, I, I just vaguely. Vaguely remember something like that. Yeah, so Wikipedia. Cool. Uh, so well, Cooper looks that up. All right, last member of the Sinister Six. Uh, I can never remember the guy's name. I'm looking at his picture. He's got the helmet on, and for some reason I can't. Sorry, what was that? Winston Beck is his real name, Mysterio. Mysterio. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about him. What do you got? Uh, there, goofy appearance, but interesting, uh, interesting idea for a villain. Uh, you know. Uh, Failed special effects wizard, uh, you know, turns you know, and turns to life of crime. Um, he had uh, this is the villain that you want when you want to put Spider-Man in these fantastical situations, and then you want an out for it. Like you know, it's not really, you know, you're not really fighting aliens on the moon. It was all a special effect, and it was all a hallucination created by Mysterio. And, you know, it's set up and it's established that he can do that, so you buy it. And, you know, it makes for every once in a while, it makes for an interesting, uh, you know, way to shake things up. So he was good for that. Mysterio was always good for having an, an excuse to put Spider Man in situations where it's not just, you know, urban, you know, New York City. Uh, yeah, it's nice to have those outs as opposed to just he woke up and it was a dream or it was <laughs> a hallucination based on Scarecrow's fear gas. Right. You want to get into Batman? Yeah, hey, that was still one of the best episodes of the animated series. It was. I was. I was it really was. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, it totally was. Hmm. I'm not saying it wasn't good. I'm just, you know, swerve endings like that. You know, anytime you get the rug yanked out from under you, it can be it, that's hit or miss. And when it works, it's pretty good. But it's going, uh, but going yeah, with the whole going with the same elsewhere in <laughs> or the new the boys. In, it was in an autistic Newhart. boy's mind all along. <laughs> no, dude, New Heart. The entire television series was a dream he had. Yes. I'm going too old no. school for you guys, aren't I? No, I don't remember no, that. That's what you're about. I mean, hell, I went old school. Same elsewhere. <laughs> fucking watch soap operas from the 80s. I remember that. One more important one, thing. One of the... One other thing about Mysterio is that, uh, uh, kind of like the Kingpin, um, Mysterio had one of his best moments, actually, in an issue with Daredevil. Oh, uh, this was when uh, you know Kevin Smith actually wrote a couple of issues of Daredevil in the very early 2000s, I think it was, where uh, Mysterio's revealed to be the uh, villain behind you know this series of, event- of events that you know where he's trying to drive Daredevil insane and um, it doesn't work. He ends up killing you know Karen Page, but um, it doesn't work and and you know Daredevil ends up you know kind of humiliating him and and um, and. I hope I'm not spoiling this, but this is, you know, this is like a 14-year-old story. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Mysterio, supposedly it's been retconned that it wasn't really him or that he, it, it, but in the story he ends up killing himself. And the last line was, you know, because, you know, Daredevil humiliated him and said that, you know, nothing he's ever created is ever, you know, really original. You stole every idea that you had. So his 
his parting word as he puts a gun to his head is, you know, I stole this idea too from Craven. Dang. <laughs> Damn. Nice. And just for the record, spoilers are welcome here by and large. Unless something is ongoing, uh, and even then, I mean, I resist the urge to spoil on a frequent basis uh, stuff like Game of Thrones because I everybody know everybody dies. Good. Good. Yeah, yeah, everybody. There you go. But uh, stuff. But so don't worry about spoiling stuff here. It's unless it's ongoing, in which case, you know, and, I mean, if the ser- if the series, if a season of television has been over for more than three months, I figure the onus is on you. Not on me. I no longer have to tiptoe around it. Okay. So you're fine. Any, anything that old, if you if you're not aware of it, or you know, sorry, you, we don't have to tiptoe around that one. I still recommend <laughs> checking out that Daredevil story arc because it's really good. It's uh, Kevin Smith has written comics on and off, you know, from time to time. Not all of them are good. Most of them aren't that great, but that one that one holds up very well. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, Mysterio, I always thought he was really awesome as a kid. I was like, oh, he's got a cool fishbowl on his head. Oh, that looks so cool. <laughs> Though in the Spider-Man 2 video game, I loved him. I love Mysterio because he, he was all awesome in his boss battle, but you'll run into him later, and he's just a fucking joke. <laughs> is, that the one where, like, is that the one where you uppercut him one time and beat him? Is that Am I thinking of the right one? Yeah, it's like you, you uh, run into him at a uh, like some convenience store robbery or something. And <laughs> okay. I, was, I was pressing X to uh, skip the cutscene, and then all of a sudden it's just uppercut. I'm like, did I break the game? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I love it. I love that game. Oh, such a good game. I never finished it because that fucking boss at the end with you trying to defuse Doc Ock's bombs. That's where oh, I that game, Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Stopped right there. But that game was so good. It really was. It's one of the few like uh, comic book games slash movie games that are worthwhile in the past what twenty years. <laughs> they prefer. The, the web sling in physics, so it was fun to just go around the city, you know, with no for no particular reason. Oh, yeah, jumping off the Empire State Building was awesome. Yeah. Unless you didn't jump far enough what? out and you ended up hitting halfway th- down. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I ended up doing that a lot. But, yeah, Mysterio was cool. I, was, I just always dug what he did. He was, so, he was so unique. And, like, the fact he was some special effects wizard and he was creating illusions. You don't often see that. Good job, Stan. I think it didn't Stanley create Mysterio. Oh yeah. Probably. Yeah. Even though Stanley runs his mouth a lot and apparently he, he, he takes a lot of credit for things he didn't do. Somebody and that's my phone again. Him. Yeah. Everything everything within the first forty or so issues of, of Spider Man you can credit to Stanley and Steve Ditko pretty much equally. They I think a lot of the it, it gets kind of murky as to who created what when. I'm I'm very comfortable just saying it was both and being happy with that. I think I think he likes to like act like it was him though. I think that's what pisses people off. That's what I've heard. Yeah, well, I, Dan just doesn't deny. You know, he he you know he takes credit for what he did create, but he doesn't necessarily you know he may not necessarily go out of his way to credit the other person that uh, created whatever it was with him. He doesn't deny it, but he won't, you know, he won't no, compress him for the chance. information. No? Yeah, mm-hmm. compress him for the information about it. Yeah, sometimes, but like, you know, it's it's becoming a little bit more common knowledge now, especially with, uh, you know, the Avengers and, and all the stuff, all these characters that Jack Kirby, you know, co-created with him are, you know, you know becoming much more popular. Uh, you know, Iron Man and um, Thor and, and all of these, all of these other things. You know, behind you know behind everything Stanley created in the, in the '60s was you know was a phenomenal artist that you know that contributed at least half as much to it. Yeah, yeah. See, I, didn't, I actually read an article about it like a few months ago about how much credit does he really deserve, and I was like, oh, that's a really interesting thought. I never thought of it like that. Because you know, half the time people don't tend to give the artist a lot of credit because writer, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've, 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 written, I've written all. Of, all of one comic in my life. <laughs> I don't know. Personally, I'd go the other way around because uh, comics is such a visual medium. If you don't have a good artist, the greatest writing in the world is going to fall flat because you're choosing to present it that way. Well, here, here was the thing about Marvel in the '60s was that there was so much, there was so much stuff being put out, and Stanley was responsible for so much of it. That was what the Marvel style was. Was you know he would write a really loose plot synopsis of whatever that issue of whatever that comic was at the time. He'd hand it off to his artist, and they'd 
fill in, you know, 22 pages of art based on a very loose outline. And then they'd hand it back to Stan and he'd write the dialogue and he'd write, you know, you know, narration that he's well known for. So it was more collaborative. It was more, you know, the artist had much more creative uh, freedom. You know, it, luckily enough, he was paired with, you know, some of the greatest artists that ever worked in comics, and, you know, uh, Steve Ditko and, and Jack Kirby and, um, you know, Wally Wood and, and uh, all of these great, great, you know, visionary guys back in those days. So he was in good hands with that. It just so happened that he was. And, you know, we got, you know, the first, you know, 10 or so years of Spider-Man. Some would say the first 20. You know, we got 104 issues of Fantastic Four with, you know, him and Kirby and, we got Iron Man and we got the Avengers and all of this stuff, just one after the other after the other. Yeah. And we stand, stand there every step of the way, but so were a lot of other people. <laughs> Didn't he not want the Silver Surfer to have that damn surfboard? That's what I read. I, it was on crack. I don't remember. The fact is always right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that'll be a fun fact to look up after this is over. All right. I think that's going to pretty much wrap us up. So it's plug time. Cooper, what do you got to plug? Oh, what don't I have to plug? <laughs> Hardest working right, man on so, the internet. Yeah, well, that's what Teasley calls me. I do not, I do not deny it. Uh, well, let's see. Podcasting wise, pretty much everything I do is on the Rattles and Broadcasting Network. So yeah, that's here. You're listening to it. Good job. Continue doing so. There's the Metal Hammer of Doom, which is on Tuesday, every other Tuesdays with myself and Mark Rattlich, where we talk metal and or make funny jokes halfway through. Uh, this. Not not this week, the week after this week. Me and him are doing uh, our favorite metal covers of all time. That's going to be an amazing podcast. <laughs> Damn it, throat. Don't give out on me now. It's going to be an amazing podcast because Mark loves covers and I like covers. Oh, it's just going to be a fun time. It's going to be kicking back, shooting the shit, and talking about who covered what. Does one yeah, of you have insane. Hammerfall's version of Youth Gone Wild? No. Ah. Not. Well, I mean, I can do I can get a whole... I'm, I'm going to... I mean, I could always get... Uh, Oh, what's that damn song? Hammerfall covered, uh, oh, some fucking 80s song. I just forgot what it was. Oh, hold on. I'll look it up in a second. Yeah, there there was a Hammerfall cover of a song, and my buddy's like, this is the heaviest version of this. It was My Sharona. There with you. This is the heaviest version of My Sharona I've ever heard. And then I looked up to the destruction version. He goes, shit. I'm like, yep. (laughs) Thrash metal's heavier than power metal. Yes, it (laughs) is. That's how this works. (laughs) And the uh, week after... The week after next. So pretty much in three weeks or two weeks. I don't know. But yeah, the week two after weeks. that, two weeks. Thank you. No oh, math. Uh, we'll be doing Austrian Death Machine's newest album, Triple Brutal, before, you know, Mark goes on the Jonas Exodus and we don't see him for like three months. Uh, it's going to be terrifying. But yeah, that, that's a thing. And there's also the podcast co-hosted by myself and the man who was on earlier, Jason Teasley as I like to call him, Teasley, you bitch, from the cheap seats where he and I talk sports. So really, we've come to the uh, realization that we're more of an NFL podcast because while I enjoy and respect all the uh, the other three major sports in the in America, as well as soccer and all the other, you know, all the minor sports like curling and I don't know, badminton, the only thing me and him really pay attention to is football. Yeah, we kind of just do football. And this last episode, it's kind of a shorter one, but you get to hear me do a 10-minute rant on why my Carolina Panthers are going to fucking suck next year. Oh, that made me so mad. And then we make more inside jokes and talk football. But really, we just make inside jokes because after I finished ranting, we talked football for 15 minutes and then devolved into silly. Who would have thought? <laughs> and then there is my my baby of a podcast. The Since I Writer podcast, where it's myself and two of my best friends. We, we talked to side too, which is uh, Power Rangers, and it's Japanese equivalent. So, yeah, we've been kind of gone for the past two, three weeks. Uh, it's been a lot of scheduling, midterms, sleep deprivation, you know. So, hopefully, we'll be back in this upcoming week with some stuff. We've got a lot to record, a lot to talk about. It's never going to end because we're covering three weekly shows. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, yeah that, that's a fucking lot of stuff. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Usually we release stuff on Friday, on uh, Mondays and Saturdays. But Mark has told me I can release shows on the same day as other people record shows. So uh, maybe we'll be getting a lot of stuff coming out. I don't know. 
And then a uh, final podcast I have to talk about is the Cooperative Multiplayer Podcast, which is on the TWNE After Dark page on Spreaker.com. It's live on uh, Saturday nights at midnight. It's pretty awesome. It's uh, myself, Daniel Anderson, uh, Sean Garmer, and the returning host, at least for this week, Stephen Randall, talking about video games. It's going to be great because now that Randall's back, we can have focus and not big jokes about Kellen Winslow for uh, 20 minutes. Uh, it gets so bad because that, like, that one week we invited Gary, who was Sean's co-host on, and we just evolved into silliness. It's a common theme with me. But yeah, it's it's going to be a good podcast. Not sure what we're going to talk about, but you know it's always worthwhile listening, at least in my opinion. I mean, hell, I listen to it every week because I'm on it. <laughs> and then, uh, then finally, I have a column that sometimes comes out. It's called the Hammer of Doom News Report on 411mania.com. In the music zone, typically it comes out was supposed to come out Monday night, but I'm always late, so I like, usually look for it like Wednesday night. <laughs> Poor Jeremy. But yeah, that, uh, I'm hoping we get it out this week. The news is like a week, like two weeks old now, but it's still talking about the Kiss Hall of Fame call, controversy stuff, and even though that is old news, it's still fresh news because yeah, everybody wants to hear it. Well, exactly, that, and it's, there's still stuff to be talked about, I mean. If I haven't you know, seen it, it's big, Yeah, I mean, it's it's big news that KISS aren't going to perform at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they can't get the original KISS together. So, yeah, because everybody's a bunch of whiny bitches and they're a bunch of 60-year-old men who can't get their underwear out of a wad. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that is that is my 10 minutes of plugging. Who's next? <laughs> All right, Ben, uh, what do you got going on? How much time do I have? Do I have? You got time. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 30 minutes. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to remember. I try to get all my information accurate here. Um, I I self publish a comic called Soul Exodus. Uh, you can check it out at, and uh, you can order it. You can check out some web comics and uh, updates on what's going on with that on my website soulexo.com s o u l e x o dot com. Also on the comics Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash soulexo. Uh, I also pencil a comic called Revolution of the Mask, which we're hoping to, me and the uh, creator, Louis Lovehog, we're all um, hoping Ooh, to, Lee yeah, we are hoping to get some new information about uh, when we're going to, what, what uh, avenues we're going to take that in. We're thinking about uh, going digital. We're thinking about doing something in, in trade. We're going to be moving forward on that very soon. I hope I'm waiting on some new information. But, uh, yeah, check out uh, Linkar's website for that. It's uh, atopfourthwall.blogspot.com. Um, I will be appearing, you know, I, you know, sort of. I'll have a table. I'll be exhibiting at Hasbury Park Comic Con on April 12th and 13th of this year. So if anybody, for whatever ungodly reason, if you're in the New Jersey Asbury Park area, it's actually a very nice part of New Jersey. I shouldn't, you know, disparage that. But it's uh, if anybody's going to be out nice. there on that weekend, yeah. There's a shifting scale if it's nice for New Jersey, right? It's it's nice. It's, it's beachfront. It's fine. They're rebuilding from Hurricane Sandy. They, you know, they they need a they need a you know all the economic boost they can get. It's it's good. It's a good part of New Jersey, trust. But yeah, I'll be I'll be appearing, uh, you know I'll, have, I'll be exhibiting at Asbury Park Comic Con on April 12th and 13th. So if you happen to be there, check us out. I'll be selling you know comics, prints, uh, all kinds of stuff there. And of course, I also draw title cards for a little podcast you may have heard of called Long Road to Ruin. Uh, I took the uh, last episode off. Uh, I needed a break, but I will be back, and so will uh, Sean Comer, apparently. We'll be back this Tuesday with Mark Radlich as they cover the Evil Dead series, uh, and we'll be doing title card art for that. That's probably how I'm going to be spending my weekend, uh, but I regret nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I always look forward to seeing what, what you managed to add Mark and Sean into. <laughs> Yeah, so I think which, you're gonna like. I think you're all gonna like this. Which is getting assaulted by the deer head, the taxidermy deer what? who's getting attacked. That's my favorite scene from those movies when Ash is freaking out and the t- the animatronic uh, taxidermy deer head is laughing at him and he's laughing back at it. Is one of them getting <laughs> um, assaulted by that? I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a hint as to where I'm going with it. One of the two of them may or may not be a deadite, 
Um, oh, okay. I know. I, I can. I have ideas now. Okay. I'm looking forward to so, seeing them. Yeah, but yeah, check them out. They'll be uh, they'll be on this coming this Tuesday. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you guys for being here, Ben. It was an absolute pleasure. You're very knowledgeable on the subject, and I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you, Coop. Always a pleasure to have you on. You guys are both welcome back anytime. I take requests for shows, and or if I have a topic that you want in on, just hit me up. I'm I'll try to work everybody in if possible. My plugs are going to be brief. I write uh, a weekly news column that goes live every Friday in the MMA zone of 411mania.com called Locked in the Guillotine. This week, I look back at UFC Fight Night, Gustafson versus Manoa. I preview UFC 171, Lawler versus Hendricks, subtitled No Buys, because I don't think anybody's buying that. A- <laughs> that's, that that's a different topic. Uh, you can hear me every week on the 411 Ground and Pound Radio Show. It goes live every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm either hosting or I'm a panelist. I get to be a panelist this week because Mark's back and he's going to host again. Yay me. This means less prep work. Uh, Everyone Loves a Bad Guy is every Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm getting back to Batman next week. I'm making a hard commitment. We're going to... so. We can, you all can look forward to that next week when we touch on pretty much everybody but the Joker, I feel. We're just going to have some fun with that. Anybody you have on that one yet? I have no uh, guests lined up at this time, Coop. So if you're interested, I will put your name in the hat, which I will then draw out. I'm very very much so interested. (laughs) All right. But that's going to wrap up my plug. So for Benjamin J. Cologne, great artist, and very grateful to have him here. For Robert Cooper, I am Robert Winfrey. Oh, there it is. Uh, Blog Talk randomly deletes. Sound bites, apparently, but this one survived. (laughs) All right, so for the aforementioned gentlemen, I'm Robert Winfrey saying, remember, bad guys are what make good guys look so good. Without them, they're just guys in tights. So say good night to the bad guys.